Um, I think someone else just shared their screen. Yeah, so who, who is sharing his screen because he's going to share like a short video. Yeah, but you can like, uh, you can share back it like after, after I'll do the introduction. Got it. Hello, everyone. Welcome. I hope you can hear me well. Um, and uh, welcome for uh, good good afternoon, good good morning, depending on where you're located. Welcome. Uh, welcome to uh, our second data science summer school organized by the Herdy School Data Science Lab and uh, generously supported by uh, Herdy School this year, which we're extremely grateful for. Um, as um, you might have, uh, if you have been with us for quite some time, you already know that we had introductory courses at first. You can uh, see all the materials at our website. And uh, today we're proceeding with actually our final workshop in the advanced series of the courses, but also in general in the summer school. And uh, I would like to, as usual, remind you about some technical and organizational rules um, and housekeeping rules that we have uh, here on Zoom and on the parallel stream session on YouTube. Um, if you're on Zoom, you are muted. Um, your cameras are probably off. Uh, you can put it on if you want, uh, but please do not unmute yourself. Uh, unless you do have a question. Uh, you can put your questions in the chat. We will address them to the instructor or the instructor can see the questions for themselves. Um, also, if you do want to ask a question, please, we ask to raise a hand and then we will let you guys speak up. But uh, as I can see, the group today is actually not that large. So maybe you can just unmute yourself and ask a question uh, if you do want to do so. Uh, if you are in the parallel stream session on YouTube with us today, uh, there is still room on Zoom. So if you do want to join Zoom session, please do it now. Uh, but if you want to stay on YouTube, it's fine. You can put your comments uh, or questions uh, in the uh, live chat on the YouTube, and we would either respond to your question right away there, or we'll address your question out loud uh, to the instructor. Uh, I would also like to remind everyone, per usual, that the Zoom session is being recorded. So if you do unmute yourself and you turn your video on, you are automatically agreeing for your voice and your image being recorded. Uh, so I think that's it for the technical rules. And uh, uh, as I already mentioned, today we have the final workshop in the summer school series. And we have today transformations in the natural language processing. And we have Maria Antoniak as our instructor today. Maria is a PhD candidate in informational science from Cornell University. And she's about to start her postdoc at the Allen Institute for AI on the Semantic Scholar team. She has a master's degree in computational linguistics from the University of Washington and has worked as a research intern at places like Microsoft Research, Twitter Cortex, Facebook Core Data Science, and Pacific Northwestern National Laboratory. And Maria, the floor is yours. You can share your screen now. And again, thanks everyone for participating, being with us, and good luck on your final workshop and have fun. Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Maria. Uh, you should be able to see my slides and everything now. If at any point you don't see my slides or anything goes wrong or you can't hear me, um, just put it in the chat. Um, I can see the chat while I'm presenting, so I might not always like notice your comment right away um, if I'm talking, but I will eventually notice it probably. And if I don't notice it, um, like Olga said, feel free to unmute yourself and um, interrupt me if you need to. So um, as Olga said, um, I'm just finishing up my PhD at Cornell, where I work with uh, David Mimno in natural language processing. And I'm especially interested in unsupervised methods um, and the application and evaluation of those methods when used for small socially specific data sets in disciplines like computational social science and um, the digital humanities. Um, my work has focused on studying how people write about themselves and interact with each other um, in online communities, especially online healthcare communities. Um, you can read about my work on my website. Um, you can find all my papers there and um, other resources and links and stuff. 
Um, I also have a blog. You're free to check that out as well. Um, but today, um, yeah, we will be talking about transformers. Transformers are um, an exciting development in NLP from a few years ago, um, but that are still dominant in NLP. Um, state of the art uh, classification and um, other NLP applications relies on this kind of model architecture. Um, and it has for a few years and probably will for a while into the future unless something better comes along. But so far, for now, this is the dominant model architecture and we're gonna be talking about it today. Okay, um, getting started. So first, just some notes as we begin this tutorial. Um, oh, and actually, um, just one thing at the start, um, if you feel comfortable um, putting something about yourself in the chat, I would love to know where you're calling in from, or if you're a student somewhere, or if you work somewhere, um, it would be really fun for me and probably the other participants to see um, a little about who you are. Um, so feel free to put that in the chat now or at any point. Um, okay, so uh, some essential materials. This is also all available in the course syllabus, which is linked on the um, website um, for the summer school. Um, but also you can screenshot this now so that you can reference it later if you don't have that pulled up. Um, so the link goes to the slides that you see here. Um, and then we have three code notebooks that we'll be working through today one by one. Um, you don't need to open any of this at all if you don't want to. Um, you'll be able to see everything on my screen as I walk through everything. But in particular for the coding notebooks, you might wanna pull those up when we get to them um, because you'll actually be able to run them yourself if you want. Um, some of them take a little while to run, but you can be running them and experimenting, playing with the different parameters, both during the session and afterward. And it's great to see some introductions, people from Turkey, from Paris, from Uzbekistan, from London, Oxford. Awesome. It's amazing. We have people from around the world. Um, I'm in Seattle this morning. Uh, so for me, it's morning. For some of you, I think it's Friday evening. So. Thank you so much for being here and learning about transformers on your Friday evening. And for some of you, I'm sure it is, uh, you know, maybe late at night, early in the morning, Mexico City, Kazakhstan, Pakistan. It's awesome to have you all here. Um, and there's also an optional reading list. This, again, is also in the course syllabus. Uh, there is so much that you can read about transformers in NLP. Um, this is just a sample. I'm not even going to claim it's a perfect representative sample because there is so much. There's so many, of course, research papers, but also tutorials, YouTube videos, um, blog posts. Um, it's amazing the resources that are available online. I've put some of my favorite resources here and some of the kind of like key papers um, and tutorials um, that I think can give you a bit of an overview. You don't need to read any of these if you don't want to, like you don't need to read them. You don't, I don't expect that you've read these to follow the tutorial, but um, if you're curious to learn more later, these would be good places to start. And our goals today. Um, so Bert, you may have heard of, Bert is a really famous and popular um, transformer-based model in NLP. Um, BERT and similar transformer-based models have, as I said, revolutionized the field of NLP. And today we'll be talking through a series of questions. So first, how did language modeling work before the transformer architecture came along? What is the transformer architecture? Um, and what do some of the most popular transformer models look like and how can we use them? So that's when we'll get into the coding. And what are the risks and benefits of relying on these models? What real world and research applications have, have they been used for? So there we'll drop out of the um, you know, architecture details and we'll be talking more about 
um, uh, research papers that people have written, um, and also, again, ethical and practical implications of relying on these really big language models. Also, I realized I left my window open and there might be some noise coming through, so I'm going to quickly close my window. I will be right back. <laughs> Okay, might be a bit quieter now. Um, and a note that uh, some of these slides are coming from uh, a project called the Burt for Humanist Project. This is a grant and a tutorial series that I um, created and ran with Melanie Walsh, who is a professor at the iSchool at the University of Washington and David Bimno, my advisor, who's a professor at Cornell University. Um, these tutorials, unlike the tutorial today, were really focused on introducing BERT and the transformer to people from the humanities, to researchers and scholars in the humanities. So if that is you, um, you might want to go check this tutorial. Some of the materials and slides are the same as from today, but there's also a bit more in the slides um, breaking things down and also talking through some like research questions and applications um, specific to the humanities. Um, so if you're interested in that, all of that's available at the BERT for Humanists website, which is linked here. And what do you need for this tutorial? Um, I think this is also explained in the syllabus, but just to reiterate, um, you don't really need anything. If you're here in the Zoom room and you can see my screen and you can hear me talking, you have everything that you need. Um, again, if you want to um, open and run the coding notebooks that we have linked earlier um, that are linked in the syllabus, you feel free to open those. You don't need any special equipment. They will open on their own and should open in any web browser and you should be able to run them from any web browser using Google Colab. Um, we'll talk about that later and I will introduce to you and show you how to use Google Colab if you haven't used it before. Um, but again, you don't need any special equipment. Um, and yes, put questions in the Zoom chat or again, feel free to unmute and ask a question if you can't get my attention especially. <laughs> And our schedule for today, this is extremely flexible. I am not gonna promise at all to follow this exact timing, um, but the order um, of events should be, this is the order of events, but at the exact time we finish each section and begin the next section or take a break, it will just kind of depend on when we get there. Um, but yeah, we're gonna be first doing an introduction to language modeling, kind of a, um, overview and reminder of how language modeling works in NLP. Um, and we'll also be talking about word vectors. Then we'll talk about the pre-training and fine-tuning paradigm um, uh, beyond um, transformers. Um, then we will talk about the transformer architecture um, and how it works in general before moving into two specific models. First, we'll talk about BERT, uh, which I mentioned already. Um, and then we'll talk about GPT-3, really GPT-2 and GPT-3. GPT-3 um, before finally, again, talking about research applications and um, uh, ethics and practical details of using these models in the real world. Okay, so that's the intro. Um, if you have any questions at this point, kind of like practical questions about accessing anything or like how things will go, feel free to put those in the chat and I or Olga or Hui will, um, will answer those questions for you. And we will get started talking about language modeling. So um, some of you might be very familiar with language modeling. Some of you, this might be new information. So just want to give an overview of what a language model is and how they work in NLP traditionally um, before transformers came along. So what is a language model? Um, a, la a language model is a model that assigns a probability to a sequence of words. Um, so any model that we can get probabilities of words from is a language model. 
So given a sequence of words, what we really want to know is, can we predict the next sequence of words? If we have probabilities, then we can make some prediction about which word or which sequence of words is most likely to follow um, the sequence of words that we already have. And we will um, almost always, or always, rely on some text data set to estimate those probabilities. So we need somewhere to get those probabilities from, and usually it's from some big text data set that we are interested in. Slides are um, in the syllabus, the linked syllabus on the website. Uh, so a very simple language model using n-grams. So an n-gram is really, it means a token or a word. Um, so we can have unigrams, bigrams, trigrams, et cetera. A unigram is one word, bigram is two words, trigram is three words, et cetera. Um, so what we might want to do is know what is the probability of seeing the word question after the sequence to be or not to be, that is the. Um, and we'd like to be able to predict the correct word um, given that sequence. In this case, the correct word is question, and we want to model its probability. And one way to do that, a very simple and straightforward way, is to just count. So given some text data set, maybe we have some big data set of, in this case, Shakespeare plays, um, we might go through and count how many times does the word question follow the in our data set? Um, we can do the same for bigrams or trigrams, sequences of two, three, or more words. Um, but yeah, we're just gonna count up how many times um, each word follows each other word. And we're gonna use that to calculate a probability of how likely it is that we would see this word after seeing another word. So this is a very simple language model. Um, and this process is referred to as maximum likelihood estimation. Now, this model um, makes uh, a lot of assumptions, this simple n-gram-based language model. Um, and I wonder if any of you, if you're familiar with these models, you're probably familiar with the assumptions that they make. Um, if you haven't seen them before, maybe you can think a little bit right now. If we're just counting up these words, and counting how many times one word follows another word, and then using that to predict a word given the text, some sequence of text, what assumptions are being made about how language works? Um, and these assumptions are simplifying assumptions that allow us to make a model, so they're useful, but they also will restrict the usefulness of our model, and the power of our model to really accurately model human language. So the usage everywhere has the same meaning. That's a great one. Yeah. So as long as we see um, the same sequence of words, we're going to be making the same prediction. It doesn't matter what else or like where else we are using this text or seeing this text we're always gonna have the same probability given the same sequence of text. That's a good one. Semantic differences are not considered. So same idea, like uh, one word can have multiple meanings and they're all just gonna get collapsed into one. Um, so that's gonna be messy. Yeah, so those are great, great examples. Um, so two that, well, so first one that I would highlight is just, is called the Markov assumption. So the probability of a word relies on the previous word. That's the main assumption of this model. Um, it could be not the case, um, but uh, the main assumption we're making is that if we um, uh, calculate the probability of a word using the previous word, that this will actually tell us something about language and that we will actually be able to make a prediction that makes some kind of sense. So that's the main underlying assumption. And we're also assuming that the probability of a word doesn't rely on, for example, the other words preceding and following. And that's of course not true in most cases, like usually the probability of a word um, 
it does rely on more than just the one previous word or the two previous words or three previous words. It might rely on the whole sentence or a whole book that came before um, the current word. And it might also rely on following words. The speaker or writer might know what they're going to say next. And so what they say now might depend on that. Um, we're also assuming that the probability of a word doesn't rely on the speaker. Um, and of course, like the words that I use might be different from, different from the words that you choose to use. So that's not true, but it's another simplifying assumption. Um, we're assuming that the probability of a word doesn't rely on the speaker's context. So where I am, who I'm talking to, that I'm on Zoom right now, teaching a course, these are all going to influence the words that I use, but that is also not included in our model. And anything else, really. So other than the previous word, um, we are not including any information in this really simple Ngram language model. Um, so this is kind of the most basic language model, and we're going to see how transformer-based models um, improve on some of these assumptions. Now, we might want to know, um, especially given all these assumptions we're making, how well does the language model work? How well does it model the language that we want it to model? Uh, oh, sorry, and there's the question. Do the assumptions apply more in some languages than in others? Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah, so what language are we speaking here? I'm just um, thinking about English, but certainly, yeah, which language you're speaking and um, that might influence both like the words that you choose and also like the grammatical structure and like how that, so, I didn't include that here, but we're assuming that there's no like particular syntactic structure besides the, you know, unigram or bigram or trigram um, word patterns. And of course, the grammatical structure will influence which words you choose, and that's going to differ based on the language in addition to other things. So yeah, definitely language used will influence as well. And again, is not we're just treating all of all languages the same in this case. Um, so we might want to measure the model performance and see like how well does our language model model language. Um, we want to know how good our language model is. And one way is to use log probability on a set of held out texts. So it's just um, exactly what we were doing to make predictions. Given some text that was written by humans, um, we're going to calculate the probability of that text. So just the probability of each word given the previous word. Um, and we're going to take the log probability because these are going to be very small probabilities. You can think about, um, you know, it, how often a certain word follows another word. It's not going to be very frequently, probably. So if we have many small probabilities, we usually, instead of multiplying them over a sequence, it's easier to take the log and add them. So that's where we use the log probability. And the higher this probability is, the better our model is at predicting real text sequences. Um, but this method has a problem. Um, if anyone knows what the problem is, you could put it in the chat now. So if we're just adding up probabilities over a sequence, and then we want to compare these probabilities across different models, for example, why might the comparison uh, maybe not be a fair comparison across different models or different data sets. So one problem is that we have different sequence lengths. And so longer documents will just by their nature tend to have lower probabilities because there are more words and more chances for lower probability words. And so it's not totally a fair comparison if we just use log probability. So we can also instead use a metric called perplexity. Um, perplexity, um, again, we can use to measure language model performance. 
and it represents the normalized inverse probability of those test sequences. Um, this is very similar to log probability. We're just making a few changes, um, and it accounts for those differing data set sizes and different sequence lengths. Um, and in this case, because it's the inverse, lower scores indicate better performance. So this is one way, a uh, really common way of me measuring language model performance that you will see in all different kinds of NLP research, um, including older research and more recent research. And we're gonna come back to this metric um, near the end of our coding part of this tutorial um, in a while. So remember this metric perplexity um, later on. Now, you may have heard of uh, language models and you may have heard of large language models. So what are large language models? Um, how are they different from just language models? These are also sometimes referred to as pre-trained models and foundation models. They're not necessarily, these terms aren't necessarily completely overlapping, but mostly overlapping. Um, these models rely on their, their language models, like what we just talked about, but they rely on vast amounts of what's called pre-training data. So while some performance gains come from the model architecture, which we'll talk about for the transformer, for example, in a bit, a lot of those gains are actually just coming from the sheer amount of data that's being used to count and create probabilities. It turns out that you, you have a ton of data and you use that data to calculate probabilities before making your uh, word predictions. That works really well. Um, we will make better predictions when we use more data in general, or at least so far that um, generalization hasn't, hasn't been disproven. We might eventually hit a wall. There's a lot of debate about this and whether um, more data is just the answer. Maybe we just need more data and that's all that's necessary to um, solve language modeling. Or um, some would argue it's not just data, but also the model architecture, how we design these systems, common sense and grounding that the models have. So you and I are agents in the real world. We move, we have effects on things, you know, I can like move an object and understand, you can think of like a little kid learning about the world around them. Um, and a lot of it is like cause and effect. They try things and some things work, some things don't, their parents give them feedback. Our models can't do that in this quite the same way in the real world at this point, like they can't move around and try things. So again, there's a whole debate about like, is it necessary for models to do that to like really produce human-like language? Or is it, again, is it sufficient to just have a lot, a lot of data? Um, and yeah, common sources. So if we want a ton of data, where do we get it? And the answer is mostly the internet, which I see a comment in the chat. Um, I'm surprised to see Reddit used for training. Yeah, I think you should be surprised to see Reddit used for training. If you spent any time on Reddit, you know that uh, there are wonderful parts of Reddit. Um, a lot of my research um, actually studies Reddit and how people interact with each other on some of these healthcare subreddits. So it's a fascinating place and can be really useful, but it also, of course, it can contain a lot of toxicity. Like you're saying, it can have less formal language, um, which that might be good. Like you're saying, that actually might be helpful. But in this case, the goal is really just to have a lot of data and it's uh, I'm not going to say it's less important. I think it is important what kind of data choices we make in uh, when we're curating these big data sets. Um, but often not a lot of, um, there, there's not a lot of curation involved usually. It's just, where can I get the biggest data set possible? Okay, I'm going to grab that data and I'm going to throw it into this model. And we'll see more about this later um, with the transformer model and the specific data sets that have been used to pre-train those models. But yeah, it's often things like Reddit, web scrapes, um, Wikipedia is really popular as a um, big data set to use for training. Um, and also uh, fiction and books. Um, there are some really popular book data sets that are 
that contain, um, um, I think mostly self-published books that people again have put on the internet. Um, and again, you can think about, oh, that's such an interesting choice. Why self-published books? You can think like about the genres We'll talk a bit more about that later as well, because this book's corpus is interesting and is used for some of these transformer models. Um, but anyway, so we'll talk a bit more in detail about this later, but um, common pre-training sources include these big web scrapes usually. Um, okay, so that's language modeling. Now I wanna give a brief, in the same vein, a brief um, review or introduction to those who haven't seen before, word vectors and word embeddings. So word vectors um, and word embeddings have been around for a long time in NLP, um, but um, they've started to be used in new ways and created in new ways via these um, transformer-based models. So we're gonna start with the older versions and then work our way towards the um, transformer version of word vectors. Um, so word vectors, the concept underlying them or the assumption underlying them is this uh, sentence, which is a really famous sentence in NLP known as the distributional hypothesis. And it says, you shall know a word by the company it keeps. Um, this is like one of the most important, if not the most important <laughs> principle in NLP. So in other words, we can learn about the usage of a word by studying the context in which it is used. Um, and one of those contexts are its surrounding words. So we already saw that with the language model where we were using the preceding words to make predictions about the next word. Um, and more generally, what we're doing is we'll use a word's usage, usage patterns as a proxy for its semantic relationships to other words. Um, so what we would like to measure really are these semantic relationships. So what does a word mean and how does that meaning relate to another word? Is it the same meaning? Is it the opposite meaning? Are they antonyms? Are they related in one way, but not related in another way? We can't actually measure that, um, but we can use these usage patterns, the company a word keeps as a proxy. Um, Question in the chat, any instances where company annual reports are used for pre-trainings? I don't know of a pre-trained model, like a big pre-trained model that uses company reports. I don't know if they're, well, I suppose there are a lot of them. It's not my field of expertise, but I have definitely seen, there. there is like a branch of NLP that focuses on these types of like financial reports and trying to, for example, like make predictions about how the company is going to do in the future based on their annual report. And then of course the companies then are aware of this research and then they'll write their annual report in such a way to like try to hide that. And it's this like back and forth between <laughs> researchers and, and writers. Definitely you can fine tune. Um, we'll talk about this later, but there's a website called Hugging Face where you can search for these different models. And for all I know, there is a pre-trained model on there. But yeah, we're gonna cover exactly, we're gonna cover transfer learning and how you could do this yourself uh, later in the tutorial. So semantic similarity, um, again, we're often interested in measuring the semantic similarity between two sequences of text. This might be two words or it might be two sentences or documents. Maybe we wanna know how similar are these two news articles to each other? How similar, for example, is this um, a website text to a Google query? Um, that would be one way of doing information retrieval. It's calculating similarity between those two pieces of text. But again, we, since we can't actually measure the semantic similarity because our model doesn't actually understand these words, it doesn't actually know the semantics, um, we use a dis distributional similarity as a proxy for semantic similarity. So it's really important to keep that in mind and think carefully about what are we actually measuring. Um, you'll see often in research papers and tutorials, um, people will just revert to saying semantic similarity, but what we are actually measuring is distributional similarity using these models. 
Um, so to measure distribution of similarity, we rely on matrices of word counts. Matrices are um, lists of lists of numbers. You can just think of them that way. They're big lists of lists of numbers. And word vectors, going back to where we're going in this section of the talk, we're interested in representing each word as a vector, a list of numbers. So a vector is a list of numbers and a matrix is a list of list of numbers. And because once we have each word represented by a vector, by a bunch of numbers, then we can measure, for example, geometric relationships between those vectors. So we can answer questions like, um, are the vectors at the same angle? Are they the same size? How do these numbers compare to each other? Are they exactly the same or are they very different? Um, this is what allows us to measure the relationship between words and text when represented as vectors and to take advantage of our distributional hypothesis and again, use it as a proxy for semantic similarity. Um, so, just as an example of what these vectors might look like, again, we'll start with a matrix. So here I'm just showing a word by word matrix where um, the numbers in these cells refer to the um, how often we see these words um, co-occurring together. Um, so maybe cat and kitten co-occur more often than cat and puppy for example. Um, and that might tell us something that about whether cat and kit kitten are like more related to each other, more semantically similar than cat and puppy. Um, and we hope, we just hope that that's the case. Um, and once we have then these lists of numbers, which in this case are just counts of how often the words co-occur, now we have a list of numbers, which is a vector. And now we can do all these, um, Again, like measure, we can measure all these geometric relationships between these vectors, which I'm showing on the right. So really common, a really common way to measure similarity between these vectors is called cosine similarity. So we're interested in the angle between the vectors um, and vectors that are pointed in the same direction, we will assume have the same meaning and vectors that are pointed in the opposite direction have the opposite meaning. And newer models um, are really good at this. Um, and we'll see some examples um, in a bit. Um, you can think about um, some problems here. Um, again, maybe some of you already know what some of these problems are from prior study that you've done. Um, and maybe some of you, even if you're seeing this for the first time, maybe you can think a little bit, just looking at this matrix of word by word uh, probability or accounts, sorry, what are some challenges? Or like, do you think that using these counts will actually work as a proxy for semantic similarity or is this gonna break down in some cases? So if you have any ideas, you could um, put them in the chat. We're only taking into account um, pairwise similarity. Yep, yep. Um, so I'm providing like a really simple example here, but some of these other models will take into account, um, you know, wider windows on either side of a word. Words can have different meanings. So again, we're collapsing all the meanings into one in this case, or ambiguous words. Mm -hmm. Problems with negations and irony, yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, and we have some, also there's some really subtle, some kind of like tricky problems here. So when you're just relying on word counts, like I'm showing here, you'll run into problems like, um, for example, sets of words, like days of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, they're not exactly synonyms. Like they're related to each other, but they're not synonyms but you'll see them occurring in pretty much exactly the same context. So that's a problem. You'll actually even see this for antonyms sometimes, um, that antonyms are used in very similar contexts and that it's difficult to differentiate them. Um, yeah, exactly. Opposite words often pair together, mm -hmm, like black and white. Another issue, um, 
related to black and white. So you can think of, for example, um, uh, uh, so like black sheep and white sheep. So I'm not a farmer, but my understanding is that there are more white sheep than black sheep in the world. Um, so if our model were really, you know, if, if our language model were really saying something about the world around us, we would expect to see a higher probability and like a higher count for white and sheep together. But what you might actually find is a higher probability for black and sheep together because it's more unusual. So because it's more unusual in language, when I'm talking to you, when I just say sheep, you might assume that it's a white sheep and I don't need to say the word white. And so I won't say it. But if it's a black sheep, which is something that's notable and special about this particular sheep, then I might say, oh, do you see the black sheep over there? And so we might actually observe in a data set that black and sheep co-occur more frequently than white and sheep. So you'll have weird instances like this that um, just relying on word counts doesn't, um, doesn't take advantage of. Um, there was also a question about what kind of social science questions can word vectors and embeddings address? And so many. There are a lot of really interesting research applications in computational social science and in the digital humanities using word vectors. One really popular one is measuring um, word meaning, shifts in word meaning over time. So you can train these models at different time slices and then compare how words have changed in meaning by seeing like which words they're closest to and then mapping how a word started off very similar to one word, but over decades has moved closer to some other word over time. So you can do things like that. You can also measure, um, uh, for example, biases via these models. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this later. So like stereotypes that are encoded. So um, people might, uh, associate certain words more frequently together um, in negative and stereotypical ways. And um, this is bad for our models. It's a problem because those stereotypes can trickle downstream into our like applications, like into Google search, for example. Um, but it, it also gives us a way to measure those stereotypes using some big data sets or using like a particular data set that you're interested in. Like you could do that for Supreme Court speeches and then make some claim about okay, this Supreme Court justice has more bias than this other Supreme Court justice, this kind of thing. Okay, um, how are the number of vectors selected? So the numbers that are inside this matrix are just how often each word co-occurs with each other word in this particular example, um, like latent concurring units. Yes, probably. Um, how to interpret common words like articles. You'll do the same thing. You should see them cluster together, although because they're very, very, very frequent words, you might see some kind of weird patterns. Okay, let's move on. Um, so as one example of uh, this uh, older traditional way of cal calculating these vectors, we won't just use um, the uh, co-occurrence counts. Instead, we'll use something called latent semantic analysis, or LSA. Um, LSA is a simple way of measuring distributional similarity. We will create a document by word matrix. So instead of word by word, now it's document by word, where each entry, again, is a count. So how often does this word occur in this document? Then we're going to weight those entries. Each of those counts will weight by something called TF idea term frequency, inverse document frequency. This is a really popular weighting scheme um, in NLP that we use in all kinds of different contexts. And basically what it does um, is tell us which words are more important in this document. So words like articles, we would want to downweight. They probably tell us less um, for a given document because they occur in every document. So seeing them in this document doesn't tell us much but rarer words or words that um, maybe occur frequently, but only occur in certain documents, those we wanna upweight more. So that's kind of what TFIDF is doing for us. Um, then we'll run SVD 
on that matrix to get these smaller matrices that represent words and documents. And then we can use those smaller matrices, which have multiple advantages. So they're smaller, so they're easier, um, you know, computationally to work with. Um, they're also collapsing different dimensions into each other and handling sparsity, because again, each word, each document is not going to contain every word in the vocabulary. It's probably going to contain very few words out of the total vocabulary. So using SVD to um, get these smaller matrices helped us in several ways. And once we have them, we can use similarity metrics like cosine similarity to measure relationships between the words and or the document vectors. So this is one way of many to calculate um, these word vectors or word embeddings. Um, so there are many different ways to create these word vectors. Some you may have heard of are again, LSA, word to vec is a very famous uh, word embedding model and GLOVE from Stanford. So word to vec was introduced in 2013 um, and it used a neural method for training to discover the vectors. Although ultimately it was, you can break it down. So actually it's really similar to kind of the matrix factorization that we were just looking at in LSA. Um, and these models, again, like word to vec and GLOVE, they're again taking advantage of what at that time was a really big data set, so like Google News data set, huge data sets of news articles. Um, and they were pre-trained. So they were trained on these news articles, for example, and then applied in many different contexts into smaller tasks. Now, word to vec and similar methods like LSA and GLOVE produce static vectors where each word is represented by a single vector. So some of you brought this up when I asked you about assumptions that are underlying these models. Each word is represented by a single vector across all its many uses. And of course, that's not a great representation because words have different meanings in different contexts, and we would want to represent that. So newer methods, like those relying on transformers, which we're gonna see today, create a new vector for each time a word is used in a data set. We would call these contextualized vectors because they take context into account. Um, and we will talk more about contextualized vectors when we get into um, using transformers. Okay, so that's um, the intro to word vectors and the setup to get us to contextualize vectors. Now um, we're getting closer now to the transformer. We're not there yet, but we're almost there. So we're gonna talk about pre-training and fine tuning as a paradigm, which we've already seen a little bit. And we just talked about for models like word to vec these word embedding models. So the pre-training and fine tuning paradigm, um, as we saw with models like word to vec it can be very helpful to pre-train a model on a bunch of outer domain data. Um, so a bunch of news articles or web scrapes or Reddit, and then apply that model to a smaller um, specific task that we are interested in later. Um, so we're gonna take advantage of all those usage patterns and the context in which words are used in these big data sets, and then hone the model slightly for a specific use case. So we'll fine tune that honing part, we call fine tuning a pre-trained model, adapting it to a specific task um, or a specific data set. And this is called transfer learning. So again, we pre-train a model on a task where we have lots of data, um, for example, internet data, and then we fine tune the model on some downstream task. For example, maybe you have a particular data set that you have curated by hand that you are using in your research or at work. And so you're going to fine tune this big pre-trained model so that it performs really well on your particular data set. Um, so this kind of life cycle of a pre-trained model, we start out by pre-training again on these big data sets like the books data set or Wikipedia or the internet scrape. And we'll gradually improve our parameters by looping over these large data set and learning all the numbers that go inside the model. And then we can either, we can just use that big pre-trained model on its own to get word vectors, like the contextualized vectors that I was talking about. And we're gonna work through a code example where we do that. Um, or even we can use that big pre-trained model for a bunch of tasks. That's the case for GPT-3, which we'll see later. 
or we can take the pre-trained model and fine tune. So in this case, after all the pre-training is done, we'll gradually improve the parameters for a new purpose by looping over our smaller data set and learning to better model this small data set. And then we'll take that fine tune model and we might use that, for example, in production um, to take some new inputs, produce some outputs, to make predictions um, without making any more changes to the parameters at this point. Um, so again, we can use models with or without fine tuning. So without fine tuning, um, for example, we might uh, be interested in mapping words and sentences to vectors and, for example, measuring word similarity in the way that we did with those static embedding models. Now we do it with these contextualized models. Or we can fine tune and add these task specific heads that produce specific output patterns. So the tasks here might be classifying text by genre, named entity recognition, where we pick out people, places, and proper nouns from a text or generating text in a certain style. Um, you can kind of think of this like a kitchen tool um, where you have that like main pre-trained model and then we just stick on different heads onto this tool depending on what we're cooking today or what data set we're using. Shout out to my advisor, David Mimno for this great metaphor. Um, okay, so we are now, now that we know about the pre-training and fine-tuning paradigm, we have an overview of static word vectors and why we might be interested in contextualized vectors and language models and the challenges with language models, we're ready to start talking about the transformer. Um, I'll pause here for just a second in case anyone has questions at this point and also to take a drink of tea. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Hope we're all learning together today. All right, so let's, let's meet the transformer. What makes the transformer special? So by transformer, also just to back up a little bit, what do I mean? I mean a model architecture. So there are different ways of setting up models and um, connecting different components. And the transformer is one way of connecting a bunch of different components together and um, generating probabilities. So that makes this particular architecture special. Um, Sasha Rush is a professor at Cornell Tech. Um, and I heard him say this and I thought it was a great summary. Um, if you need to know just one thing about the transformer, its architecture is extremely efficient on modern, modern hardware. And why is that important? Why do we care if the architecture is extremely efficient on modern hardware? Well, it means that we can use more data. <laughs> if we can run faster and more cheaply, it means we can put more data in. And if we can put more data in, again, what we've found so far is that that's helpful. The more data you can put into the pre-training, the more, the better the model performance will be in general. Um, so transformers process all the words in parallel. So instead of going necessarily one by one, um, they can use, uh, for example, multi-headed self-attention um, instead of the recurrent layers that were used in prior models. Um, and this is a lot faster. So if words are going through at the same time and they don't have to wait for a previous word to be processed, that's a lot faster. And again, if we can go fast, we can we can use more data. Um, and I recommend, so this paper called Attention is All You Need um, is the paper that introduced the transformer um, architecture and emphasizes these differences that make the transformer special. Um, so a few key terms, some of these we've already encountered, model parameters. Um, by parameters, I mean numbers that are inside the model that determine how we process inputs. Um, training a model, this is deciding on the parameters in a specific model. So we're trying to figure out what all the numbers inside the model should be given some data set. 
again, a uh, vector is a list of numbers and a matrix is a list of lists. And a few more terms now specific to uh, deep learning. So a perceptron, um, if you've studied machine learning, probably the first model that you encountered is the perceptron. It's um, one of the simplest models in machine learning. Um, it's a classifier that takes an input vector and returns zero or one, or um, a value between zero and one. A layer. A layer is one step in a neural network, um, possibly uh, many, many, many perceptrons in parallel. A transformer, um, just brief definition before we go deeper, an NLP model that builds representations of words in parallel. And attention, um, we saw that in the title of the paper that introduced the transformer, attention is all you need. Attention is a way of kind of automatically deciding which nearby words should influence a word's representation. So if we have an entire sentence around a current word that we're interested in modeling, um, not every word is necessarily going to be the most helpful in understanding the current word. Some words are gonna be more helpful than others. Similar to what we did with the TF-IDF weighting for LSA, we want some way of picking out which pieces of a text sequence we should pay attention to um, when considering um, how to set the parameters for a certain word. Um, so the transformer building blocks. Um, there are four main building blocks to this architecture, input embeddings, encoders and decoders, self-attention and feed forward layers. And we're gonna go through each of these one by one. Again, some of you might be familiar with some of these concepts from other models. To some of you, I imagine this might be the first time you're seeing some of these things. So I'm trying to capture multiple levels in this tutorial and give um, both beginners and non-beginners some intuition. So um, feed forward layers. These are layers of perceptrons. Again, these simple classifiers. So we put a bunch of these simple classifiers together into layers where they feed forward. Information is fed forward through this network of perceptrons, not backward. And each perceptron in a layer is connected to every other perceptron in the next layer, um, which learns a set of weights over that input. So the perceptron in the next layer is going to learn weights over the prior, the output from the prior layer of perceptrons. Um, there's no connection to the other components in the layer, so it's parallelizable, and it prepares the output. This um, this entire set, what you're seeing like in this figure that I'm showing here, this is the feed forward layer. It's a layer of layers. Um, this entire like set of layers I'm showing you is this is the feed forward layer. Um, and we can think of it as preparing output in our um, transformer architecture from a previous layer that does something else that's not a feed forward, that's not a feed forward layer and preparing it for some other layer that comes after, maybe an encoder or decoder. Um, next, we have input embeddings. So this is what goes into the model, into the transformer at the start. And we have, um, it depends, like different transformer models might use um, a bit different embeddings, sets of embeddings, and also exactly how they create these embeddings. Um, but in general, there are maybe three kinds that are used. So word embeddings, similar to what we saw before. Um, so uh, vectors representing words. Then we might have segment embeddings. So these tell us just which sentence we're inside. So if a document has multiple sentences, for example, these embeddings will just, for example, they'll just be zero and one. So zero for the first sentence and one for the second sentence. And it gives us an idea of which sentence we're inside. And then position embeddings. So because everything's parallel, these words are all going for a given document, the words are going through together at the same time, we have we lose a notion of position. So which words are in which spot in the sequence. So we're gonna include a position embedding, which tells us which position a word has in a sentence. Um, you can think of it as, you know, for example, it could be like 
you could think of it like a count, like this word is in the first position, this word is in the second position. It's actually a bit more complicated than that and follows kind of like a sine curve. Um, but you can just think of it as telling us which position a word is in in a sequence. And often what we'll end up doing, what I'm showing in this figure at the bottom, and which we'll see more later, is um, that we will add up all these different vectors together, the position embeddings, the segment embeddings, and the token embeddings. And those added up vectors are then what will go into the transformer. So this is all kind of happening before the transformer, and this will be our input to the model. Yeah, the figure I'm showing is for BERT specifically, a specific transformer model that's very popular. Again, some of them, for example, the segment embeddings might not be used for other types of transformer models. Then encoders and decoders. So these are um, the most important part. <laughs> uh, so for the transformer, we have um, blocks called encoders and decoders. Some transformer models will have only encoders. Some might have only decoders. Um, they're very similar these um, two blocks. So an encoder processes input and it consists of six identical layers. So we'll have six encoders, for example, on top of each other. And each of those layers includes, so each encoder consists of a self-attention sublayer and a feed-forward sublayer. So we already talked about what feed-forward is and we're gonna talk about self-attention in a moment, but you should just know that an encoder has these two components. Um, then decoder, very similar, it also has a self-attention layer. It also has a feed-forward sublayer. Um, but here we're focused on producing output. So for example, for machine translation or generating a story based on some data set, um, the decoders are used for that to generate new text. Again, we'll have stacks of these decoders. So for example, we might have six identical layers where each layer consists of self-attention, feed-forward, and then also this multi-head attention sublayer. Now, what is attention? What is self-attention? Let's go into a little bit more detail about this. So again, attention or self-attention tells the model which words are most important for the current word, kind of like a feature weight. Um, so rather than trying to use the whole sequence to model a particular word, we want to instead have the model attend to certain parts instead of others. Um, and this process looks like this. So for each input word, we'll generate query, key, and value um, vectors by multiplying an input vector by query, key, and value matrices that we learned during training. Um, if it's helpful, you can kind of just ignore the query, key, and value words and thinking about what is a query, what is a key, and what is a value, and just think that we have this set of three matrices, these lists of lists of numbers, and we want to learn what are the best numbers to put in these matrices um, that we can use to multiply by these vectors to get the output that will be what we want. So once we do that, we dot product the query and key vectors together. And then we use softmax to get weights that sum to one. So softmax is just a procedure by which we can transform a vector. Um, and whatever numbers are in those vector, we'll transform them to um, uh, numbers that sum to one. So it will look like a probability. That's why softmax is often very useful for us. We want something that looks like a probability between zero and one. And then we'll multiply that value vector by um, the weights that we found and we'll sum up the resulting weighted value vectors. So this is the process, what's happening inside these self-attention layers where we are discovering what weight to assign. Like the point here is to find what weight to assign to which um, input vectors. That's our goal. Um, here's a great figure um, from Jay Alomar. I really recommend his visualizations and tutorials. This is from the Illustrated Transformer, um, or actually this might be from, uh, the, actually, sorry, I think the link is correct here, but the title might be wrong. Sorry about that. Um, but in the slides, if you click on this, it should take you to the right tutorial, but he has a bunch. So the Illustrated Transformer, Illustrated BERT, Illustrated GPT-3, 
beautiful visualizations that can help you walk through these individual operations that are happ happening inside these encoder and decoder and feed forward and all these different blocks that are inside the transformer. Um, but um, just to summarize again, what's happening inside these attention blocks, so repeating the process that we just, that we just read, we prepare some inputs, so, um, and then we score each of our hidden states. So we're assigning weights. Um, and then we run softmax over those scores so that they sum to one, so that they look more like probabilities. We multiply those weights by our input vectors. So now we know that one of these vectors is maybe more important than other vectors, and we should attend to that vector rather than the other vector. And then we sum up those weighted vectors. So now we have um, one vector that will get fed to the next, the next step. So that's what's happening inside those self-attention blocks. And there's also something called multi-head attention. So in this case, attention is run multiple times for each word. And this allows the model to capture more nuance and different inter interpretations for each word. We're just running it multiple times. Um, so this is the, all of that kind of put together into the transformer architecture. So this is a figure from that original attention is all you need paper. Um, and you can see our um, multi-head attention blocks, uh, feed forward blocks, and how these are connected to each other our input embeddings, and finally, our um, output um, probabilities. So again, particular models that we'll look at, like BERT or GPT-3, will have variations of this architecture, but this is the basic transformer architecture. These are the building blocks that BERT, GPT-3, and other transformer-based models build upon. Um, so there are many different kinds of transformer-based models. I've mentioned BERT several times and GPT-2 and GPT-3, which are from OpenAI. Um, there's also T5. This is a really popular model right now from Google. It's a huge, these are all big and they keep getting bigger. T5 is huge. Um, there's also OPT um, or OPT um, from Facebook. That's a really new model. Again, a really huge model. Um, and many others. These are just some of the most popular transformer-based models that are accessible or at least somewhat accessible um, to you and the public. Okay, we're over an hour in. Um, I think now would be a good time first to pause for questions and also to so I'll pause quickly for a question and then we'll take a five minute break. So if anyone has questions at this point, know that I've given you kind of the overview of the architecture at this point. We're gonna drop more into a lot more detail about BERT in the next section. So we're gonna look at a specific model and how everything works together. So that's coming, but if you have questions, you can take them now, otherwise, See BERT being used most in data science. Is this because of famili familiarity or other reasons? Um, BERT is, it's four years old at this point. It was introduced in 2018 or was published in 2018, the paper introducing it. So it's actually one of the older models <laughs> for these transformer-based models in NLP. And I think that's one of the reasons that it's so popular. It's the model in NLP that people usually think of when they think of transformer-based models, but there's actually a lot of newer models. So yeah, it might just be that people are most familiar with it. Yeah, GPT-3, we'll talk about this, but hard to fine tune and also not as accessible. So BERT is accessible. You can, you can go fine tune BERT and we will do that. Um, GPT-3, you have to pay or have a license for access. So we will see some of these challenges. Yep. Uh, yeah, so we have a challenge with um, document lengths. We haven't got to this yet, but a lot of these models require that the input documents be a certain length. Like they can't be longer, for example, than 512 tokens. 
We're not really going to talk too much about that today. Um, but there are, there is a lot of attention on this problem in the research world. So there's a model, for example, called long former, um, that tries to address this, these like longer, much longer documents. There's also a, um, challenge data set called long range, I think called long range arena, um, that you can use to see how well models perform on longer documents. But on a practical level, usually what you'll do if you're using something like BERT is either you, you just chop off part of the document if it's too long, um, or you will divide it into multiple documents. You can also do things like have a sliding window. Um, that, yeah, there's multiple kind of hacky ways to address that problem, but it is a challenge. Um, but okay, I think we're gonna pause now and five minute break. And we'll be back in five minutes to continue. I'll briefly turn off my camera.
All right, we are back. Um, and we are going to get started talking about BERT. Um, and first, oh, there was one more question in the chat. Um, if we take a pre-trained classification model from the Hugging Face Hub, which has been trained to classify tweets, is there any incentive to fine tune the model if you're also classifying tweets? I'm trying to understand the purpose of fine tuning if you have the same use case. Um, yeah, uh, it, it depends. <laughs> so what I would do, um, well, so it depends what you're trying to do with the tweets, first of all, are you trying and which model you're using? So for example, if you're using something like BERT, um, and you said to classify tweets. So if you're classifying tweets, that might mean you have a set of labels that you are interested in, like maybe you're trying to classify um, or like predict the sentiment in the tweet or classify, um, I, I don't know, uh, the, the political party of the person writing the tweet or something like that. Like you have some categories that you're trying to predict using the text of the tweet. If that prediction task, if your set of labels doesn't match the task in the pre-trained model, which it probably doesn't, um, then if you're using something like BERT, you're gonna need to fine tune so that you have that classification part. So you're actually outputting probabilities for the labels that you're interested in. For models like GPT-3, you actually might not need to. And so in that case, the question will be less about the task because you can do things like prompting, which we'll talk about, um, and more about just like how well it fits your data. So maybe you're interested in tweets on a particular topic or at a particular time or a particular place, and just how well that matches the pre-training data is gonna determine whether it would be advantageous to fine tune. Um, and so really the answer is I would try it and see which one works better for your data set. All right, let's talk about BERT. So BERT most often is used for classification. So we're gonna have two examples today, classification using the model called BERT and then generation using GPT-3. Both of these models can be used for other things as well, but that's probably what they're most known for. So we're starting with classification and BERT. So what is BERT? Um, BERT stands for Bidirectional Encoder Representations from Transformers. Um, it's a large language model, like what we've been talking about, that's trained on a very large amount of text and that can use words or model words in context. So it creates contextualized vectors rather than the static vectors that we um, looked at before. And it relies on the transformer architecture. So again, word vectors, going back to what we talked about with like word to vec and glove and those static embeddings and LSA. So usually for word vectors, one point, we have one point or one vector for each vocabulary item. So in this example, we're showing, um, for example, the word nature, science, religion, and art. Um, and we just have one point for each of them. And we can see like maybe science is closer to religion in this particular data set. And whereas nature and art are far apart, but we just have one vector for each of these words, even though they might have different meanings and be used differently in different contexts. Now in BERT and with other contextualized models, now we have one point per instance of a word in context. So every time that a particular token or word is used in a data set, we will have a new vector. I suppose it's possible that two vectors could be identical, but probably they'll be at least slightly different. But you can see them clustering, you, hopefully, <laughs> we'll see these words um, used in context clustering together like what we're seeing here. So now um, each of the colors represents one of those same words from before, and this is using the same data set. Just now we have those contextualized vectors. So you can see like this um, big orange blob that represents every time the word nature is used in this data set and this blue blob for art, teal for science, and red for religion. And we can also kind of see that for art, for example, it looks like there are actually um, two clusters within that art cluster. And if we go and look at the context in which these words are used, um, like the documents in which they were used, we can start to understand why those clusters, why we might be seeing these clusters. So we'll see different word meanings. So for example, within this blue art 
cluster, which can, seems to contain multiple clusters inside of it, we see that, yeah, art is being used in different ways. So there's art um, as in, um, you know, painting and um, beautiful objects. So that's that top cluster. We can see it's being used, for example, when art was sacred or make rhyme in art. Um, but then art, because this is an older data set, um, older English data set, um, art can also be used as a verb. Um, so we see sentences like, thou art to me a fly, or art thou not prone, something, something, something. Like we're just showing a snippet of these sentences here. Um, and so there is a separate cluster for art being used as a verb and art being used as paintings and statues and beautiful things. Um, so this can be a really fun way to explore a data set. And if you're interested again in word meanings and shifts in word meanings over time, now we can have a more fine grained view of what these word um, distributions look like in context. And you can see that even as I'm running this tutorial, <laughs> I'm saying things like word meaning and semantic similarity again, which we talked about before. It's not really the meaning of the word, it's just distributionally how these words are used in this data set, but you'll hear me and others kind of fall back on this proxy language of meaning. What do X and Y represent? Oh, great question. Um, uh, we will see this, um, we will actually be creating this figure um, in the coding part of this section. Um, so we'll see this in a little more detail in a little bit, but they don't necessarily represent anything. Um, in this case, we ran PCA, which is a, another um, way to uh, get smaller, smaller vectors and smaller matrices out of a, out of a big matrix. So these word vectors might have like you know many dimensions. They might be long lists of numbers, and we're going to collapse them so that there's just two numbers that hopefully represent those longer numbers. PCA is one way to do that. SVD is another way. So we're just reducing those word vectors to two dimensions. Sometimes you'll find that those dimensions do actually represent something interpretable. Um, like here, you could, based on the examples that you see here, you might try to interpret like, okay, along the X axis on this side, it seems to be words more on about this, and but it doesn't necessarily mean anything. Um, okay, so these are contextualized vectors, and this is why we're excited about contextualized vectors and why we like them more than static word vectors, where we just had one point for all the uses of a word in a data set. Now, why are people excited about BERT specifically? Um, so like other pre-trained models, there can be one big pre-trained model that we all share and then fine tune on smaller data sets. And when BERT was introduced, it had state-of-the-art performance on a bunch of different uh, natural language processing tasks like language understanding, sentiment analysis, natural language inference, paraphrase detection, textual entailment, and more. Um, it's no longer state-of-the-art. There are other models that perform better because they use even bigger data sets, for example, um, but it still performs very well. Um, and, you know, kind of going back to the question someone asked, like, why do I see BERT so much? Yeah, I, I think it's, a relatively, it seems silly to say it's old given it's only four years old, but in the time span of these models, it's an older version of these models and it's just very popular, very well known. Um, so it performs very well, but is no longer state of the art. Um, but there are also a lot of people who are wary um, and are critical of BERT. And sometimes these people are overlapping. So you can be excited about these big models like BERT while also being skeptical about them. So some problems with these models are that they can encode many biases that are difficult to measure or correct. They often use poorly documented training data. They're very large and training them takes up a lot of resources like computational resources and energy. There's also work on, for example, environmental costs. These models are so big that there are concerns about the environmental cost of training them. Um, and they can be hard to interpret. So just keep these critiques in mind when working with these models. We'll discuss some of these um, uh, considerations as we go, um, but I recommend checking out, um, for example, these two papers um, just to get started. There's a lot more work in this area, but 
on the dangers of stochastic parrots. Can language models be too big? This is a good overview paper. Um, and the importance of multiple languages and multiple cultures in NLP research. Um, so a lot of these models are focused on one particular language, usually English, um, and there's not as good of resources for other languages and other domains. Um, so I recommend this um, keynote talk by Alice O um, discussing some of these problems. How does BERT work? Um, let's step through the model architecture of this particular transformer. So at the, um, in the first step, um, uh, I'm gonna step through um, step by step going up a chain of mostly encoders for BERT. Um, and our goal right now isn't to understand every inner working. So I'm not gonna go back to like the individual operations that are happening inside the attention blocks, for example, that we talked about earlier, but to get a sense of what's inside this model so that um, we know how pieces are connected to each other. So first at the bottom of the slide, we have our input text. Um, so it might be like, like our sentence that we were just looking at in the clusters, the art of science, something, something, something goes on from there. Um, this text is then tokenized, so split into tokens and, or broken into word pieces. So this is a way of breaking up into sub tokens, larger tokens and handling out of vocabulary words. So if we have a word we don't know, we might be able to break it into subwords, and then those subwords we may have seen before. And we also add some special tokens, like you see here are the brackets and CLFs. This is one of the special tokens. We'll go through a whole list of these special tokens in a bit, but here we have this start token, CLS, and then our tokenized, the art of, and it goes on from there. Then we have our set of um, uh, uh, embeddings, which we talked about before. So we have um, word vectors, segment vectors, and position vectors. And we're gonna sum these up. Um, and these will encode information about the word, about which segment, or for example, like which sentence we're inside within this document, and what position this current word is at within the sequence of text. Then these are gonna go into a set of encoder blocks. So BERT is just encoders, it doesn't have decoders. It's just a set of encoder blocks. Um, these encoders are an important part of all transformers as we saw before. Um, though again, sometimes you'll see them match with decoders, but not in this case. Um, and these encoders are big. There's a lot going inside of them. We talked before about how there are both these self-attention sublayers and also feed forward sublayers within each of these. Um, so inside the encoder, again, first we enter an attention block. Um, these are, there are like several streams of activity inside that we talked about before, but essentially, again, we're just multiplying vectors by weight so that we know which words we should attend to when modeling the current word. Um, then we add and normalize our previous and current vectors and enter that feed forward block, which again, we talked about before, where we're going through these layers of perceptrons and just feeding forward information and preparing it kind of for the next block. Um, but uh, remember, I feel like this is a good point to emphasize, which is that there's so much going on inside these models and they are huge models and they're very difficult to explain and interpret. But I want you to like not be too intimidated by them either. At the end of the day, for example, this feed forward network, is just a bunch of perceptrons. Um, and um, which are quite simple and are making simple classification decisions. So if you go back and study what a perceptron is, how it makes these decisions, it's just happening many, many, many times, um, which makes these models like unwieldy and a little difficult to work with or very difficult to work with. Um, but each individual component, um, we're capable of following and understanding what's happening. So then we're gonna repeat this process, this self-attention and feed forward sublayers, those are part of the encoder block. And then we'll have multiple of these encoder blocks stacked on top of each other, just repeating again and again and again, these different operations. And then optionally at the end, um, if we wanted to do, for example, text classification, we would add two additional layers because we need to convert um, this final vectors at the end of these encoder blocks into a probability distribution over our class labels. So again, maybe we are interested in labeling um, 
the genre of a piece of text. So maybe we have a set of 10 genres that we're interested in and we have some training data and some test data that have these labels that humans have applied. Um, and so we want a probability distribution, a vector of length 10 that sums to one that look like probabilities. And then we can use that to make a prediction, which genre has the highest probability in this vector. And that's gonna be our, our prediction for this particular document. Um, and that's it. So that's the BERT architecture in a nutshell. Um, again, keeping track of all these numbers and operations can be difficult just because there's so many of them, but the individual pieces and operations combining those pieces are really mostly just addition, multiplication, and normalizing to sum to one. Um, and again, unlike other deep learning architectures, transformers, or the BERT model in particular, is processing the entire input at once. And that allows, so you can see the words at the bottom, they're going up at the same time. And that allows for more parallelization and reduced training time, which means we can use more data. Okay, so that's the architecture, but now how do we actually use BERT in our own work? Um, we're gonna use a library called Hugging Face. It's a Python library for transformers, not just for BERT, but for many, 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 many different transformer-based models. They have a whole library of um, models and also of data sets. So it's a really great resource um, with a lot of great um, researchers working there. It's a really exciting place, really cool um, community. They have forums and like lots of documentation. So if you have any questions, Probably your question has already been answered on one of their forums, but you can also post there and people are really nice. Um, but at the same time, I would say the documentation assumes a background in deep learning and machine learning and some familiarity with other libraries like PyTorch and also with software engineering. So if you're coming from a different background, I think Hugging Face is amazing, but it does make some assumptions about your um, your background and understanding of these different libraries and models. And that was part of the motivation for our BERT for Humanist tutorial. So again, if that's you, you might wanna go um, check out that tutorial. Um, just a clarification, if we use the BERT model, we don't really need to train the data, it's already pre-trained. Yes, um, yes, um, we will get to this in a moment, but yeah, you, extremely unlikely that you will be pre-training a BERT model yourself. Um, so that's why we use Hugging Face partly because it has all these models prepared for you, all these pre-trained models that you can load. Someone else has put in the time, money, and energy <laughs> to pre-train the model. And then you're either just gonna use that pre-trained model as is, or you're gonna fine tune. Again, for example, adding that classific classification layer at, on top of the pre-trained model. BERT differs from, so the BERT model, the main thing is that, yeah, so everything's going through at the same time. And also it's a stack of encoders. There's no decoders. Um, that's probably the main architectural difference, for example, from GPT-3, which we'll see later. Um, okay, and so the other thing about Hugging Face is that some of the documentation assumes use cases are traditional NLP tasks like classification. And again, depending on what your research or work is in, these NLP tasks may or may not make sense for you. So things like named entity recognition or um, yeah, like classifying the genre of a text, maybe you don't have labels, maybe you don't have a particular task in mind. And so in those cases, um, um, your task might be something more exploratory. And I think that's not as well represented in the Hugging Face documentation. And again, is why we were interested in making this BERT for Humanist tutorial series and talking to people about their real research use cases in these other domains. All that said, Hugging Face is great and it's what we will be using today. And yes, we're gonna use Hugging Face to select a pre-trained model. There are many, many other models available via Hugging Face, including languages um, beyond English and other domains, um, but we'll be using a English BERT pre-trained model today. Um, it can be hard to find the best or the right pre-trained model for your particular data and goal. Um, and my best tip would be, I mean, check the research literature if you can, 
So search through papers and see if someone has fine-tuned a, a model for your particular, or sorry, pre-trained a model for your particular task or data set and see, um, you know, how did they do it? Is it available? And also you can browse on Hugging Face itself on their website. You can search for models, like different, again, different languages, different domains, like there are models specific to Twitter or other social media. Um, there are, I think someone mentioned um, an interest in clinical language. There are a lot of, um, yeah, clinical language using uh, like medical notes and also um, biomedical abstracts, like academic uh, research language models that are pre-trained on that. I believe there are like COVID specific models, many different models. So go on there and search, see what's there, play around, see what works for your data set. Um, and then another question that I think some people have using these models for the first time is, can I work with BERT on my laptop? And the answer is yes. So yes, we've talked many times at this point about how big these models are, they're huge. So how can you use them on your little laptop? You actually can use some of these models even directly on your laptop. It'll just be really slow. Um, it is not pre-training, but you can fine tune these models and use them sometimes on your laptop. But um, the better thing to do is to, if you have access, of course, to um, your own cluster, then use that. But if you don't, we can use Google Colab. So um, most importantly, uh, the key here is that it will speed things up a lot if you have access to GPUs, um, graphical processing units. Um, this again is why we really like the BERT architecture that we can like paralyze or transformers in general that we can like paralyze things. Um, we can take advantage of GPUs. Um, it's a specialized electronic circuit for computer hardware, um, often used for gaming, for example, but because GPUs allow for parallel processing, they're also um, often used for machine learning, so for transformer-based models. Um, but where do you get a GPU? Where do you get access to a GPU? So you may have access to GPUs through your work or through your university. Um, maybe there's a cluster you have access to, but um, if you don't, there are also resources like Google Colab. Um, I think there are also some other places, some other like free online resources or paid um, online resources where you can get access to GPUs, but we'll be using Google Colab today. These are um, interactive documents. So if you are, if you've worked in Python and you've worked in Jupyter Notebooks, they're just Jupyter Notebooks, except that they're hosted by Google um, for you. <laughs> so you get to run on Google's hardware um, uh, on the web. So you, all you need, again, all you need is a browser. Um, it's free, um, although you will have limits on how much you can run, how many notebooks you can have open at any particular time. Sometimes it will get busy and you can't access it all. So um, they also have a paid plan. So if you are really relying on these models for your work or research, that's one way to get access to um, the GPUs to speed everything up. Um, to use GPUs with Colab, as we'll see in the notebook, you'll need to specify this both by setting an option in the notebook that you want to use GPUs and by sending it to CUDA. CUDA is a parallel computing platform created by NVIDIA. Um, and it is um, it, it organizes all your code into these different jobs and sends it to these different, um, if there are multiple GPUs, it takes care of organizing everything for you behind the scenes. So you're just going to send it, send your code to CUDA and you'll have to say that explicitly in your code. And we'll see that in the notebook. Yeah. So I, again, I think I haven't used any others. I think like maybe Amazon also has a version of this that you can use. Uh, I mean, definitely they have, um, you know, uh, um, like uh, their servers that you can use and you can pay for. I don't know if they have exactly a notebook platform. If anyone knows, put it in the chat. I haven't used it. I've only used Colab, but this is one great way, especially to get started working with these models and seeing whether they even make sense for your particular data set and your particular use case. 
how should you pre-process your data? So this is a really important part um, and can be a little tricky to follow at first. So for BERT in particular, you need to format your text, your input text in a way that BERT can understand. Um, so first, and some of these are constraints that can be a little frustrating to deal with. So first, each input sequence must contain no more, no less than 512 tokens. Someone mentioned this earlier in the chat. We talked a little bit about it. Um, it's a problem if you have longer text, especially. And there are different ways of dealing with it, but each input sequence that you send to BERT needs to be 512 tokens. So if the sequence is shorter, we need to pad the sequence by adding special pad tokens. Um, if the sequence is longer, then we're going to truncate, chop off the rest of the text. Or we could divide the text again into um, multiple documents and send each of those. You can use like a sliding window, um, but you won't be able to send the entire document if it's longer than 512 tokens um, as a single input. Um, you'll also need to add some special tokens. We saw one of those in the example, and we'll see more now. And we'll need, also need to divide the word into word pieces. Um, which I'll show you exactly how that works in a moment. And I'm showing just a little code snippet of what this will look like in our um, in the Google Colab notebook using Hugging Face. So we're going to call something called a tokenizer from Hugging Face that will do all of this for us. But we do need to specify what exactly, like how we want this tokenizer to act. Do we want to truncate it? Here I'm saying yes. Use truncation. Just chop off the extra part of the documents. Um, do I want it to pad? Yes. If the document is too short, please add padding. Okay. So we can set those options within this hugging face um, tokenizer object. Can BERT specific tokenized data be used with other models? Um, I mean, you could, like, you could put that input into like a traditional, like, logistic regression model if you wanted. But I don't know that there would be much point in doing that. Um, you would probably want to tokenize, like for yeah, like for a traditional like logistic regression model, you would want to split the word, maybe apply some like again like TF-IDF weighting. Um, so I don't know of an advantage to doing it other than like maybe the word pieces. Although as we see, there's challenges with the word pieces. So yeah, I wouldn't necessarily use, you will use this same tokenizer object from Hugging Face um, for other transformer models. We'll see that for the GPT-3, or sorry, GPT-2, which is the model that we have access to through Hugging Face. We don't have access to GPT-3 through Hugging Face. Um, we'll, uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll use that same tokenizer object, um, but not necessarily process in exactly the same way. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, so if we're comparing across different models, these tokenization schemes can actually make a big difference. Mm, if your sentence is significantly shorter than 512 tokens, does it affect the model's accuracy? Um, I wouldn't think so, but I don't, mm, like if every document in your data set was really, really short, like only one word or something, well, First of all, maybe it might not be the right model to use. I'm not sure of the answer. I haven't ever tried that. Definitely you can use tweets, for example. Again, there and there are tweet specific, um, for example, BERT models that have been pre-trained on tweets. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure. I would, I would try it <laughs> and see what happens. So these special tokens that I've mentioned a few times, these are the special tokens for BERT. So first there's this CLS token. This is the start token of every document. Um, we'll put it at the start of every single one. Then we might have a SEP token placed between each sentence, a PAD token. So if our document is shorter than 512 tokens, we can add these padding tokens to get up to 512. Um, and finally, if we see um, after running our tokenization, if you see a token that starts with two hash signs, um, that indicates the start of a word piece where a single word has been broken into multiple parts. 
Um, these word pieces are, well, maybe let's look at an example first, and then we'll talk about the word pieces. So as an example, um, here is a poem by Wordsworth. Um, and let's say we wanted to prepare this poem as input to Bert. And I feel like the reason we're using a poem as an example here is you can think about how important um, each word, the um, position of each word, the um, separations between the lines and the sentences are in a poem. These were very intentional choices by the author and people who study poetry are very interested in these individual choices. So the thought of kind of um, removing all of that when you prepare it for Bert um, can be a bit alarming. And it's a good, it's a good point. Like we are losing a lot of information, or at least some information when we go through this tokenization process. So after Bert tokenization, this is what that poem would look like. So we have our special tokens. We have the CLS token at the start. We have um, padding tokens at the end to get us to 512 tokens. And then we don't have any um, sub tokens except at the very end here. But in this particular case, um, you can also see these um, some word tokens. So for example, the first one we have is more lens. Um, and so the two hash signs in front of lands indicate to us that this was a word piece. It wasn't like this in the original data set. Um, I think we can see that. So here you can see in the first line of the poem, the last word is more lens. It's one word originally, but here it's been broken up into two words. Um, there are different ways to do this kind of um, breaking apart of words into subtokens. The word piece algorithm is one way to do this and it does it algorithmically. It like um, discovers how to break up these words automatically. And for that reason, you will sometimes see, so Morelands was pretty intuitive, but you will like the next one, Yarrow, um, that one's a little bit less intuitive to me, at least. Um, like why exactly it's split there and not somewhere else. Um, so it's a little bit different from you know, there are other systems to lemmatize or stem words in NLP. And those are often like highly customized, like handcrafted, even like rule-based systems. Word pieces are not that. These are automatic systems that again, automatically given a data set will learn how to separate words into sub tokens. So that's why you might see some kind of weird sub tokens in here. Um, and there's been work on um, other ways to do this that possibly will work better. So there's some research on this. If you're interested, you can look up word piece and alternatives to word pieces. But in the original BERT model, this is what they used. Um, and it's what you will see if you use um, um, the pre-trained models from Hugging Face, the like um, original BERT model, and also some of these um, like popular variations, they, they, they use word pieces. Um, and then we have, um, what, once we've done all of this within Hugging Face, we're also going to have mappings to um, words, positions, and word IDs. And I'm just bringing this up because we'll see this in the notebook, in the code notebook that we're um, about to go into. Um, and we will need to keep track of all of this. I mean, it's kept track for us by Hugging Face, but we're also going to need to then like extract these numbers keep track of them and use them to map back between words in particular contexts and mapping them also into their um, tokens after the BERT tokenization process. All right, so we are going to move now into our first coding notebook. Um, this is gonna be using uh, what I think is a really fun data set. Um, I made this notebook with Melanie Walsh for um, one of our um, a tutorial for um, BERT for computational social scientists. And this data set um, use, is a set of Sephora makeup reviews, online reviews from the Sephora website. Sephora is a makeup and skincare uh, store that has a website where people can leave reviews. Um, and it's a set of 5,000 reviews collected by Connie Yi, who's, uh, I believe, collected these while a graduate student. Um, and it's a <laughs> funny set of reviews. It's um, the reviews of, I think, mascaras and eyeliners only that mention crying. Um, 
so some of these reviews will mention as a positive thing that these makeup items perform really well, even when the author was crying. And um, uh, it's a fun small data set. And we're going to take a look at how different words are used in different contexts um, in this data set. So I'm going to stop sharing briefly. And then I'm going to reshare. All right. Um, pull up the chat again. Okay. So again, um, if you want, you can open this notebook. Um, the link is in the chat and also in the syllabus. And you can even try running this on your own right now. Um, but you don't have to. If you want to just watch as I go through the notebook, um, you can definitely just watch. I'm not going to run the code myself live just because, like I said, sometimes um, you like they won't grant you GPU access because like if you have another notebook running or so I'm just worried that if I try and run things live, it might um, things might crash. So I'm just going to walk through it myself. But on your own, please do try to run it um, and change things around and play with the code. So again, we're using the Sephora Makeup Reviews data set. Um, and we might want to try to understand the experiences of customers who are sensitive to makeup in various ways. Um, do reviewers use the word sensitive similarly or differently when describing different products or when rating a product positively or negatively? Um, what about re when reviewers discuss how well makeup holds up at different places? How do those different contexts compare? And we can explore this using BERT um, without fine tuning. So we're just gonna use the pre-trained model in this case. Um, and we're gonna find those um, contextualized word vectors um, for each word usage and context. And we're gonna plot those in the same way that we looked at those word clusters um, uh, in the slides, the example with art and science. We're going to do the same thing here for this data set for some particular terms that we are interested in and um, maybe learn something about how people think about these different products. Um, we will also be using um, actually a model called Distilbert. Um, you can check the paper. I think that's what's linked here. Uh, well, the link goes to the Hugging Face page, but it should also have the um, paper linked. Distilbert is a smaller version of the BERT model. It uses only um, part of the pre-training task, um, and it is just smaller. The um, amount of parameters is smaller, but still works very well. Um, we're going to do that just for ease of, you know, like how quickly we can run things in this small notebook, and we'll be using Hugging Face. So our goal with this notebook is to create a figure like this. This is going to be, um, this is our goal. So like we saw in the slides, we're trying to create this two-dimensional plot um, where we can see clusters of words used in context. So if you hover over these different points, you should be able to see um, how the particular word is used in a particular sentence. So here, these are all for the word sensitive. Um, so you can see the context in which the word is used, and then also some metadata for the particular review. So what was the product item, the product type, um, and what was the brand of the product? And you can start to see just by hovering and taking a look um, at these different contexts that it looks like sensitive is often used with, we have a cluster where it's often used with skin, sensitive skin. And then here we have a cluster where sensitive is used with sensitive eyes. We have two uses of sensitive, two main uses of sensitive in this data set. So this notebook is, our goal is to create this figure. Um, we'll start by importing our necessary Python libraries and modules. Um, and we need to install the, you need to um, install um, the uh, Hugging Face library. Um, it's called Transformers. So pip install Transformers. 
This will take a moment to run, but um, once you do that, then you can import the library along with everything else that you need for this notebook. So Transformers or Hugging Face for Bert itself, um, the tokenizer and the model. Um, and then some data manipulation packages. We'll be using Pandas and NumPy and also PCA. That was what we used to reduce the dimensions. Um, Altair is a great data visualization package. That's what we used to create that um, scatter plot where you can hover over the points and interact with the plot. And then some standard um, Python packages. So the first, we'll load our text data set. So you can use these URLs to download um, the Sephora reviews data. Um, this is particular to this data set. If you're using a different data set, you will follow a different procedure at this point. But for the Sephora review data, we'll use these URLs. Um, we'll download um, each of these uh, review sets into a pandas data frame. That's what I'm doing here. We're creating a list of pandas data, frame, data frames, one for each URL. Uh, and we're also pulling out some particular metadata that we're interested in. And then once we have all those together into one big data frame, we can print out a sample of the data and take a look at what these reviews contain. So we have um, a star rating. Um, we have um, the age of the person writing the review, the date, a title, um, the review itself, which is in this description column. Some of them are empty. Um, the brand name, the name of the product, the type of product, and then um, a URL. Uh, and we can print out the distribution of these um, different product types and brand types just to get a sense of what's in here. Um, we can also print out one full review to get an idea of um, what these reviews look like. So um, this one's like, I finally caved trying this after reading so many great reviews. Unfortunately for me, it was not meant to be Despite the brush being great, I had a hard time applying this without getting too clumpy. Um, I didn't find the results because volume wise and it's advertised and it's smudged after only a few hours on me. Sigh. Um, so this is what the some of the reviews look like. Now we're going to move into, so that was all preparing, just loading and preparing the data set itself. Now we're going to move into the BERT model and using Hugging Face. So first we need to encode or tokenize that text data for BERT. So again, we'll need to tokenize, word piece, pad or truncate, add the special tokens, all these um, steps in preparing the data for BERT that we talked about in the slides. So first, um, from the Hugging Face library, we are importing a particular tokenizer. And this tokenizer needs to match the model that we use later. So be really careful about this. Um, in this case, we're using the Distilbert tokenizer fast. Um, make sure, so it says Distilbert because we're going to use the Distilbert model, model later. So just make sure that your um, tokenizer and model match. And I would recommend actually putting these at the start of your notebook in one spot where they're just defined once. And so you know that they aren't accidentally getting edited later or anything like that. Um, so we're loading that tokenizer um, from a pre-trained model. This is, we're using Distilbert base uncase. This is the model name. Um, and so you can choose between case and uncase models, for example. You can choose between Distilbert and Bert large, Bert small, many different Bert models. This is where you're selecting which model. Um, so a question in the chat, uh, why did you not feel the need to fine tune this model for looking at reviews? Is it because you first checked the score on the pre-trained model and found it satisfactory? Um, so you could pre-train. Um, in this case, we didn't even try it. Um, a, because this is an example notebook and we don't have a particular task in mind. We're not trying to like predict the product type or anything like that. If we were, then we probably, we well, you would definitely need to fine tune because you would need to add the classification layer. Um, but also uh, it seemed to work really well. So like in the example we already saw with sensitive eyes and sensitive skin, and in the examples we'll see later, um, it seems to already be working very, very well. And that's a result of the huge amount of data that's used in pre-training. 
But if you are curious, you should try it. Try fine tuning and see what happens. Probably it will be even better then. Okay, so once we have the tokenizer loaded, then we are going to um, put our text, our um, reviews into the tokenizer. We're going to say, yes, I want you to truncate if it's too long. Yes, I want you to pad if it's too short. And we're going to return our PyTorch tensors. Um, and then we're going to print out an example. So this is what um, one of these reviews might look like. So it's the same review we saw before, but now um, prepared for BERT. So we have our special tokens. It's lowercase because we're using the uncased model. Um, we can see the word pieces. Um, and it is in the right format for BERT. Now we're going to load the model itself, the pre-trained model. So again, we're using distill BERT, which is a smaller version of BERT. Um, you could use a different model. Again, go browse on Hugging Face. You can find many different models for many different purposes. But we're using this English language small BERT model uncased in this particular um, notebook. And remember, I talked about sending to CUDA. So here you can see some that command saying send to CUDA. Um, and on that note, um, a reminder. So within Google Colab, actually, I should have introduced at the start, like what we're looking at here. So we have the code in this main window. Along the left, you have things like a table of contents based on the markdown that um, the like titles and um, other text that we have um, separating our code cells. Um, and the other thing I want to point out is files. So this is where you can upload uh, particular data. Um, if you had, like, if you were going to fine tune on a data set, this is where you could upload either like from your uh, local machine or from Google Drive. And this is where then you would see those files and also where you can save output files. So if you wanted to save anything that we're doing here for later, you could save it to here and then download it again to your local machine or wherever you wanted it. And then the other thing to point out, so runtime. So here you can start, restart the runtime and we can also change the runtime type. And this is where you can select that, yes, I want to run on the GPU. This isn't necessarily set by default. So make sure that you select this if you're gonna be doing, uh, if you're gonna be using these big models, go in here and select GPU. Okay, and then a question in the chat. Is it the case that certain types or even particular instances of BERT perform particularly well on specific data sets? And for example, in this case, using a model pre-trained on another cosmetic review did, yeah, um, certainly, yeah, I, I would definitely expect. And it, it will depend on like how far your target data set deviates from the pre-training data set. So again, in this case, we found that actually the pre-trained model works very well. Again, remember there's huge amounts of internet data um, including these models. And it's so much data that it's actually really hard to document and even know what all is in there. So for example, um, a web scrape might include makeup reviews in that data set. So it might be the case that the model already is, um, already does represent this particular data. But this is something that you will have to consider based on what you know, what, what little you know of the pre-training data and then on experiments. So seeing how well your results appear um, using just the pre-trained model um, and different pre-trained models. Um, and also what's available. So sometimes you will just be constrained because pre-training is very costly um, and um, Maybe, you know, like in this case, there's probably not, a, I, I would guess that there's not a pre-trained Sephora model. Sephora, I don't know, maybe data scientists at Sephora have pre-trained their own model, but it unlikely that you would be able to do it on your own. So you just have to use what's, what's available. Um, are you able to provide some information on model checkpoints? So we'll see a little bit about this when we get to the next notebook and when we run fine tuning but not in this notebook. Okay, so we load the model. Um, this might take a moment, um, but you should see some output like this. 
Um, and then we are going to get those BERT word embeddings for each document in the collection. So we're going to use a for loop. Um, and for each review in our list, we'll tokenize the review. Um, and then we extract the vocabulary word ID for each word or token in the review to use later for a reference. And then we will run the tokenized review through the BERT model and extract the vectors for each particular word or token used in the review in that particular context. So basically, we're creating two big lists um, for all the reviews in our collection called doc word IDs and doc word vectors. So that's the output of this particular cell where we're just looping over all the reviews and creating these lists of document word IDs and document word vectors. Each of these is going to be a list of lists. We confirm that we have the same number of word IDs and word vectors. This is good because we're going to use them to map between each other. Um, we can also print them out and just see what's inside. So again, they're going to be lists of lists. And we have these document word IDs here, which look more like counts, and then word vectors, which look more like continuous. Um, look a little bit more like probabilities. Now we're going to concatenate all of those into one big list. So instead of a list of lists, it's going to be flattened, our word IDs and our word vectors. And then we're just going to normalize those vectors um, to have a length of one. So now each um, vector will have length one. And then we're going to find all the word positions in the collection. So we'll use that array, all word IDs, to find all the places or positions in the collection where a word appears. And we can find a word's vocab ID in BERT using this tokenizer.vocab call, and then check to see where and how many times this ID occurs in our list of word IDs. So we'll create a function here, get word positions. And then we'll check to see all the places where a particular word, so we're using that example word sensitive again, all the places where it appears in a collection. Um, so here, these are all those um, position, word positions for the word sensitive in this data set. This is a small data set, so we're not going to have many, many, many occurrences of any word. Um, and these are all the occurrences for this particular word. So we're getting. Um, the word positions for sensitive and saving them in a vector. And then we're going to get the words from the word positions. So now that we know all the positions where the word sensitive appears in the collection, now we want to know the actual words that appear in context around it. Um, to find those context words, we have to convert the position IDs back into words. Um, so we'll create an array so that we can go backwards from the token IDs to the words. We're just trying to map things to each other at this point. And then we can use word lookup to find a word based on its position in the collection. So again, we're printing out all the places where the word sensitive occurs in the collection. And then we can also look for the three words that come before or after a given word, like sensitive. So here we're saying, give us all the words that are within three words before and after the word sensitive in the data set. Um, yes, can I rewind and explain why we have to separately make um, the vector and ID lists? So we want to find, can't the model take the tokenized forms? So we're trying to find, we want to be able to map to we want to be able to query for a particular word, like sensitive, find all the places where that word occurs in the model, get the vectors for those words, because we're going to want to be able to map them into that cluster visualization that I showed at the start. That's our goal again. So we need the vectors, we need the words, and then we also want the words in context around our target words, in this case, sensitive. So we're just creating these maps between all these different things and like pulling things back out of the model. There are probably other ways to do this, but this is one way, one way to do it. Um, okay. And so at this point, that's what we've done. So we can pull out 
given that we are interested in the word sensitive, we're able to pull out all the places where the word sensitive occurs, um, get its word position, and then find the words, the three tokens that um, occur before and after this word. Now we're just going to put those into, we're going to make some functions that help us get those context words given a certain word position for whatever size window we are interested in. So we're just kind of doing that same thing that we just did, but putting it into a function that we can reuse with different window sizes. Um, so I'm not going to go into detail here because it's just repeating what we just did. Um, except that, so in this case, we're just getting that context window. Here we're also, again, we're just getting that context window, same as before, but we're also cleaning up um, the output a little bit so that like the word pieces don't look as messy and it's just a little bit easier for us to read the um, tokenized output. So you can see like we're substituting the word pieces, uh, like we're removing the, um, the hash sign, for example. So just cleaning things up a little bit to make it more legible. And then um, to visualize things, we um, are gonna import um, a couple modules so that we can print things out and again, interact with them. Um, and then um, in this case, we're gonna use that to, for example, bold the word that we're interested in. So this is optional. It's just something to make the output easier to read. And you can see here, we're using a bigger window. We, yeah, we set the window size by default to 10 instead of before we used three. So now we have a bigger window. And we'll make a list of all those context views for our keyword. And now we're finally going to move into making our goal visualization that we saw at the start. So now that we have all these maps and we have our functions where we can pull out the words, the word vectors, and the context, we're going to use them to get the word vectors and then reduce them using PCA. So our goal is to measure, we don't just want to like read this list of context, we want to be able to put them onto a plot and see how different uses of this word relate to each other and whether there are clusters of different word uses. So we're going to get the word vectors and then use PCA, which is one of many different ways. Um, there are other techniques like TSNI that you could use. PCA is just one popular way to reduce these vectors from however big they are down to two dimensions so that we can visualize them on a two-dimensional plot. Yep, you can, um, these notebooks will stay available as long as my Google Drive continues to exist. Um, but you can also make, you can copy, go to file and then uh, uh, save a copy in Drive and that will save a copy to your individual Drive or you can also download as a notebook um, to your local machine for later. Okay, so we're running PCA. We're using um, a scikit-learn package for PCA. So it follows this kind of standard scikit-learn um, workflow if you've used scikit-learn before. And then we will put um, our output into another data frame that we're gonna use for plotting. So we have an X and Y um, position that will say where on the plot it goes. These are our reduced dimensions, the context and the particular token. You can see that data frame here. And then we can match back to the original text and then the metadata. So we can add back in um, things like the product type and the, um, the item, the, the brand name and any other metadata that we might be interested in adding into our visualization. For example, maybe we want to like color things by the brand name. So these are just functions to, um, or this function is just used to find that original review and pull out things like the star rating, the brand, the name, and the makeup type, and return those if they're available. And we add those into our data frame. So now 
we can plot. We have everything that we need in this single data frame, and we can create these interactive plots to explore the similarity between these contextualized vectors. So here um, we're showing again that um, plot from the beginning with the word sensitive. So again, we see this cluster for sensitive um, skin. And then below, so you can also, you can zoom in and zoom out. This is a really nice package um, for Python notebooks. Um, so sensitive skin, and in this cluster, we have sensitive eyes. You can also check what's over here. So here it's neither skin nor eyes, but the formula is sensitive and a sensitive type. So these are outliers. They don't belong in either cluster. Um, and then we can add, for example, many different words all at once, like context in which people might be using these products. So at the pool, at the gym, wedding, funeral, office, or party. Um, so we're just running through the same steps, but including multiple words. And our resulting plot looks like this. So we've colored by the um, word, um, the, the token. So the green is pool, red is office, orange is gym. And we can see that, yes, these do these word usages map to individual clusters and some of these clusters are closer together. So for example, pool and gym um, are closer together. Whereas down here, we have wedding by itself. Here we have party, funeral, with not very many occurrences. So keep that in mind. Like we only had four occurrences of funeral in this data set. So this might not be a very reliable representation. Um, and also because we're mapping to two dimensions, this is a simplification of the original data. Um, and then here is office, also kind of off by itself, although then we have some outlier points. So you can start thinking about like how these products are used by individuals, how these individuals think about these products in these different places. Um, as another kind of fun example, we can look at words like smooth, sharp, and clean. I'm just gonna go straight down because the code is the same. Um, so we have smooth, sharp, and then clean. So clean, um, we kind of have two clusters, it looks like. So down here, it's about cleaning. It's a lot of work to clean up this messy product. And up here, um, it's more about the application. So here, um, they're talking about, a, it looks like a liquid eyeliner. That's the product type. And they say, I wanted to try this one. The lines are clean and it doesn't try, mm, probably they meant dry out quickly. Um, so, um, instead of talking about washing and cleaning here, they mean it's a clean line that it's, um, delineated. Uh, I might've missed this. What's the clustering algorithm employed here? There's no clustering algorithm employed here. Is it nested as a built-in? Yeah. So there's no clustering happening here. Um, the positions are just the, um, using that pre-trained BERT model that we find the contextualized vectors based on where this word occurs in context. Um, so that's where we get the positions from and the colors are just showing us which word, um, which query word we used to get those vectors, but there's no clustering happening. It's just coming from, just coming from the contextualized vectors from BERT. Yeah, PCA is used to get the dimensions, but it's not learning clusters. Yep, yeah. They're just vectors representing the same token. So again, and we can also see for smooth, smooth and flawless finish versus smooth and moisturizes, smooth out the, here it's used as a verb, smooth out the color, smoothie. Okay, so 
try this out yourself. Um, if you run this uh, notebook, you can put in your own query words. I think we have one final example using the word long. So um, it takes a long time. It took a long time to dry versus um, makes my eyelashes very long. So different uses of the same word. Yeah, no, these are good questions. Please put questions in the chat. It's good for everyone. Yeah, you could use SVD. PC is usually used for visualization um, or TSNI. There's a whole literature you can dive into on like which algorithm is better and problems with these algorithms. So definitely be careful. Like if you were relying on these visualizations for any you know, to make any like decision or to make a claim about the data, um, you would want to do some additional tests for sure, like measure the stability of these um, of, of these measurements across like samples of the data set, for example. Um, and, um, you know, they can be, it's a 2D visualization. So some things can be collapsed on top of each other, but actually be far apart. So be careful, but as a first, um, visualization to give us an idea of which terms are used in which ways. It's good for that. But look into the literature and definitely do more tests if you're going to use this output for anything important. Um, oh, thank you. So there, it looks like there's a typo. Sorry about that. Um, thank you, Sven. Um, there's a closing bracket missing in the tooltip line. Uh, I will try to remember to fix that in the notebook later. Thank you. I can't test it right now because I don't have the notebook running, but please put in the chat if you can help each other and I will try to fix it afterward and it will update in the same notebook if you reload the notebook later. Um, okay, so that's the end of um, uh, this part. Uh, we're gonna take another break now. Let's take another five minute break because this was a lot um, and either take a break or use this time again to play with the code and try out some different queries. And we'll be back in five minutes at 10 28 a.m my time so five minutes we'll be back and it looks like there's code in the chat to fix that one um that one error okay we will see you in five minutes
Okay, um, we are back. Um, thank you everyone for sticking in for this long tutorial. I hope you all have some snacks or tea because um, we have a lot more to do. Um, also pause here, any additional questions about the notebook that we just went through, um, what we did, why we did it, um, how you could use this on your own data. Any questions like that at this point? Um, because next we'll start looking at some additional um, things about BERT, considerations to have when using BERT, and then we'll move into using BERT for fine tuning and classification. Um, and we'll be working on a different data set for that example. Yes, small question. Yep, you should be able to talk, yeah. Uh, hello. <laughs> um, my question is like, um, um, so in this notebook, we have learned about how to use BERT and PCA and combine them together. So I was wondering, like in the company, do they also use these techniques to do their um, projects? or they do something more sophisticated than this. I just wondering how how difficult or how sophisticated is applied in the company, in the real business world. Thank you. Yeah, so question is about real business world use cases. So I can speak to my personal experience and how I've seen these models used um, and also other methods used. So what the notebook I just showed, like I said, if you wanted to really make some claim about that data set or like about the similarity of these terms with each other, I actually have a paper on this um, about the stability of the cosine similarities between these word vectors and how you need to do some additional statistical tests to make sure that the results you're seeing are real. Um, but um, uh, yeah, it, so it will depend in my experience, like it is gonna depend on your use case. So as we talked about before, sometimes you might not have a model that's pre-trained on exactly the thing that you want. Often if you're at a big company, they'll have models pre-trained um, on their particular data set uh, or like types of data sets. So they'll have internal models just for people at the company to use. Um, but if you don't have that, then again, that's the, gonna constrain how useful models like BERT are for you. Because if they don't match your data, then you can't use them. So to be honest, so BERT is used um, a lot in industry. Um, for example, Google search, at least at one point, uh, was relying on BERT. So when you use Google search, it was using BERT um, uh, to connect queries and um, responses. Um, definitely used a lot in industry. But at the same time, I think what you'll find often if you're working as a data scientist and you're working with like many different data sets at a particular company, depending on like the product, use case, simple models work really well. So today I'm showing you BERT, showing you transformers, showing you these big models pre-trained on tons of data, but that's not to say that this is always the right thing to do. You might try it, like you might try fine tuning and classification and then find that actually performance is better using a really simple model, or it might be equally good or almost as good, in which case why spend the extra time, energy, compute um, to use this giant model when you can use a really small model that's also more interpretable. So that's another consideration. If interpretability is important, you wanna be able to, for example, again, like in industry, you might, you're presenting your results to your manager or somebody and you're saying, okay, like this model works really well. And then they wanna know, well, why? Why does it work really well? How is it making these predictions? What features is it using? And those kinds of questions are quite difficult to answer with these big models. So there's a lot to take into consideration. Long story short is BERT and transformers are used a lot in industry, but also you will see really simple techniques like PCA. PCA is an older traditional matrix factorization method and you'll see it all the time. And you'll also see simple models and small models, again, like SVMs. Um, 
okay, nearest neighbors, things like this, you will still see them even at the big companies sometimes. So that's a great question. <laughs> um, and feel free to chime in the chat. Um, if you work at a company or have in the past and would like to share your experience, if you've seen BERT or other transformer-based models used, or if you've used smaller models, it'd be interesting to know people's experience. But now we are going to, yep, SVMs are still really good. And SVMs are cool. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, test things on your own data. That's really the answer, as usual. Um, so now we're going to talk briefly about other languages outside of English. So we've just been looking at English so far. Um, so just briefly, um, um, BERT models beyond English. What about other languages? How can we apply these models to other languages? Um, there are many other models, again, available via Hugging Face, including other languages. And you can browse those on the Hugging Face website, as we talked about before. It can be difficult, though, also, if we talk, as we've talked about, to find the right or best BERT model for your particular data and goal. So it might take some searching, and it also may turn out that maybe there, while there are many models available, there might not be a model for the particular language you're interested in. There are more and more available as time goes on. Um, I feel like every NLP conference, you see new um, models being introduced for, for example, uh, domains without a lot of training data. So for example, some of the models that are available are um, multilingual BERT models, so including multiple languages. Um, and some of these have really cute names. People are really clever. So there's Camembert for French. Um, there's Kenya BERT for Kenya Rwanda. This was just presented at ACL 2022. This is our biggest conference in NLP. It takes place once a year in the summer. Um, if you're curious to start reading some research papers, that's a great place to start looking. This won a best paper award at ACL um, and presented um, a model for Kenya Rwanda. There's Chinese BERT, Hindi BERT, there's Mac BERT for historical English meant for, you know, like Shakespeare. Um, there's Roberta, there's all kinds of variants of BERT. So beyond language, there's variants of the BERT model and also for different um, tasks. So in this case, yeah, translation. Um, so go, again, go on there and explore. Um, but uh, you again, you they may or may not exist for your particular language. And even when it exists for a particular, even when a model exists for a particular language, it may or may not perform well on your particular data set, given the data constraints for some languages. We just have less data. Um, there are also models for different domains. So for English tweets, for Italian tweets, there's Alberto. Um, there's Cyber for scientific text. That's a really popular model. BioReddit BERT for health-related Reddit posts, etc. Um, so explore and see what works best for your data set. Now, fine tuning. Let's talk about fine tuning a BERT model. Um, so again, we start with pre-training and we haven't actually talked much about what happens during pre-training. Um, so our idea again is that we're gonna pre-train once and then reuse our model for many different applications. But during pre-training, there are two training tasks for BERT, um, masked word prediction and next sentence prediction. And the training loss is the sum of these two um, prediction likelihoods for these two tasks. So we're doing both things at once. And this masked word prediction, this is a really important part of BERT. Um, and it's also, I realize I should have mentioned this, someone asked earlier the difference I think between BERT and like other transformer models and GPT-3, for example. And this is one of the key differences and key important things about BERT is this masked word prediction task. So instead of trying to predict the next word based on the previous words, the way that we did in our traditional language model at the start of this tutorial, we're actually gonna mask, we're gonna hide one of the words but then use the full context to try and predict that masked, that hidden word, wherever it happens to be in the sequence. 
So the during pre-training mask, I forget like 15% of the words at random, um, and then try and predict those using the context around it. Um, the training data for BERT during pre-training includes two big data sets, the books corpus, which is about 800 million words, and English Wikipedia, um, which is about 2,500 million words. So two really big data sets. Um, and the books corpus, again, is, um, I believe, self-published novel or books. Um, so it's interesting to think about like why those particular data sets were chosen. There may not have been a particular rationale, it's just that they're big data sets, but you can think about what effect that might have on the model and whether some other pre-training data may have been more useful. So this is all done. All this pre-training is done before you do anything. But then once pre-training is done, we can move into fine tuning. So this is the part where you will use your target data set and you're gonna update BERT for your data set and optionally your labeled classification task, for example. Um, and what happens during fine tuning um, for classification? We saw that in the architecture before, it had the purple layers that we added at the top for classification. We're adding a new layer containing our classification parameters and um, outputting the probabilities across our classification labels, whatever labels, however many there are and whatever they are. Um, and actually all of the parameters in the model, at least in theory, are getting updated. All those many, many, many parameters in the BERT model are getting updated to mac maximize the probability of our labels during fine tuning. So a lot is happening during fine tuning actually. Preparing our data for fine tuning, we need to do a little bit extra processing in, in addition to the tokenizing that we talked about earlier. Um, so we need to convert our labels to integers rather than strings, whatever our labels happen to be, like they might be genres or um, languages or something else, some category labels. We convert them to integers. We break our data as usual um, in machine learning. We break them into training tests and evaluation sets. Um, we're going to use a BERT tokenizer to convert our data to the BERT format, as we talked about before and combine the labels and data into a torch dataset object. So we'll see that in the notebook and in the code, but basically we're gonna do all this processing of the data set, all so that we can get this data set object that then we'll send to the fine tuning process. Um, no back propagation or similar procedures. Um, actually not sure. Um, let me think about that question. We can come back to it later. Um, so once we have this torch data set, or so this process of getting this torch data set object is going to look like this. This is our kind of recipe with hugging face. Um, we're going to format our data again in a way that Bert can understand, load that pre-trained model. So both of these things we did in the previous notebook. And then we're going to fine tune the model on your data set. So that's where we're creating this object, this hugging face object called a trainer. And we're sending in our model, a set of training arguments. So that's when we will say like um, what kind of learning rate we want to use. We'll talk about these um, arguments in a moment. Um, we'll have a training data set and our test data set. We're sending those in, these torch objects. And um, we're going to also compute some evaluation metrics. Then we call train and we can also call evaluate. So there's a little bit more to it, but this is our basic fine tuning recipe using hugging face. Yeah, I don't think that the training part changes, but I don't have slides to cover that particular part of the process. But we are going to go a little bit more into the weeds right now um, to talk about these training arguments in particular. So stepping into um, how BERT learns all these parameters and how we might set some of our hyperparameters for training. How does BERT learn all those numbers? So like many other machine learning models, as you may know, BERT learns by using an algorithm called ADAM. 
um, a variant of gradient descent that computes learning rates for each parameter. So in normal gradient descent, you might have one learning rate. In Adam, we have one for each parameter. Um, so some of the training arguments that we will that we can set via hugging face before fine tuning um, will refer to parts of this algorithm. So it helps to have some intuition about what's happening during gradient descent and during Adam. So some of you may already be familiar with this, and this is just a review for others. Um, I'm going to quickly step through the intuition behind gradient descent. Um, so gradient descent, um, we have for any model, um, this isn't just for BERT, but for many different models, when we're training the model, we have something called a cost function. You can think of it as how many mistakes the model makes. And it tells us how badly our current model works. And we want that cost to be as low as possible. We want to make as few mistakes as possible. We want to find a set of parameters, the numbers inside the model. We want to set those numbers in a way that minimizes the cost function. We're going to start with a random set of parameters. That's one way to do it. I'm just giving you kind of like the simple version of gradient descent in this intuition part. So we start with, for example, a random set of parameters. And then we're going to update the parameters one step at a time in the direction that results in the smaller cost. And we can vary the size of these steps or the rate at which we take steps so that we don't get stuck. Our goal is to find this like global minimum, but that can be hard to do. We want to find the place of the smallest cost. We can think about this visually. So if along the y-axis we have the cost, so how many mistakes the model makes, we want this to be as low as possible. And then along the x-axis we have parameters. So these are just all the numbers in the model, all those different matrices that we talked about, like within the attention mechanism, within the feed forward network, all those numbers we can set to anything, um, and we want to set them somewhere along this axis so that we find the place where the cost is the smallest. But how do we find that place? We might start, like I said, in a random spot. That's the green point. And then we'll take learning steps downwards, hopefully towards our goal, towards the minimum. Um, and how big should these steps be? This is a really important part of gradient descent and its variance. Um, one way to think about this um, is that we don't want our steps to be either too big or too small. And there can also, because if they're too big, like looking at this figure, you can imagine if I had a really big step size, I would just ricochet from like side to side of this curve, right? Whereas if my steps are teeny tiny, it would take me forever to get to my goal and it, training would be really slow and expensive. So we want something perhaps in between and or we might want to vary the step size based on where we are in training um, and other things. So for example, one way to think about this is if, um, uh, if you were asking for a direct, let's say you're in a new city and you are asking for directions and you're trying to find your way to the post office. And so you might, let's say you're like on the outskirts of the city, this new place you've never been. And you ask someone walking by, like, how do I get to the post office? They're probably not gonna give you like minute step-by-step -step instructions. They're probably gonna give you a really big step at the start. Um, and they'll say, oh, you need to go to the city center and then ask someone there and they'll guide you the rest of the way. So you have like a really big step at the start. That's one way to do it. Then when you get to the city center, you ask someone else and they give you a little bit smaller step, like, oh, okay, you need to go to this street now. Then you get to that street and they say, oh, okay, it's this particular house. So one way would be to take smaller step sizes over time. You may also want to start with some extra um, small steps at the beginning so that you don't overfit to um, these like documents at the start of training. And I see someone put a suggestion in the chat for three blue, one brown. This is a YouTube channel um, that is fantastic. Yeah, I agree. They have amazing video tutorials for um, deep learning topics and also many, many other uh, mathematical topics. Highly recommend. 
So this is the intuition behind gradient descent. Again, Bert actually uses Adam, this variation of gradient descent, where again, we're learning um, particular, uh, we have particular learning rates for each parameter. And also we're doing some extra things, like I said, like we're varying the step size. So let's talk about some of these numbers that we are setting in the inside um, the trainer. So just that there's a lot of numbers here and I'm only showing some of them. And some of these numbers we can provide some intuition for, but a lot of this you just need to experiment. Um, so for the trainer, this is the, um, the um, code that we're gonna use from Hugging Face. So for the trainer, we're gonna create this first a set of training arguments for fine tuning. So we're saying during fine tuning, this is what I want you to do. So first, this is how many training epochs I want you to use. This is the size of um, how many times we want to pass over the full data set. Um, one thing to perhaps keep in mind here is just as you pass more times, the possibility of overfitting might increase. So if you're concerned about that, you could possibly lower the number of epochs. I'm showing here, I think these are mostly the default settings that I'm showing here, except for maybe the, it's, I think I might've lowered the warm-up steps. Um, the per device training batch size. So how many examples to process at a time during training? And then the same for um, during evaluation, the batch size, which is how many to process at a time. Then we have these arguments related to what we were just talking about, gradient descent and atom. So the learning rate, this is the size of the learning steps or how quickly to take them. Um, we're gonna start with this learning rate and then decrease it according to a schedule. So like I said, take smaller and smaller steps as you go. Um, so we start with this learning rate. Um, this is a good learning rate to start with. It just happens to work well. Um, but you might need to try some different rates for your particular fine tuning data set. Then we have a set of warm up steps. So um, this is a number of steps to take with small steps at the very beginning so that early examples don't have too much influence. Um, you want to be careful about this one if you're working with really small data sets. So I think this is usually set much higher. But if you're working with a really small data set, like only, you know, a few thousand examples or even a few hundred examples, you don't want to set this too high because otherwise you're not going to get far enough because um, you just don't have enough examples to travel enough towards your minimum. Um, and then we can set also weight decay. Um, in this case, it's multiplying all the weights, all the parameters in the model by this term to prevent weights from getting too big. This is a form of regularization. And the idea behind regularization is that we prefer simple models over complicated models. So you could have like many, many, many different parameters, which we end up having for these big models, but we want to reduce that as much as possible so that um, we don't overfit. For example, we want our model to generalize and simpler models will tend to generalize better. So by reducing all of our weights, not letting them get too high, we keep a simpler model. Finally, we have some just organizational um, arguments for the trainer, um, where we want our output to go, where we want our logging files to go, how often we want to log um, our output during fine tuning. So this one's important again for, depending on your data set size, you might wanna make this bigger or smaller. Um, and it's important because fine tuning can take a while even using GPUs, um, especially if your data set's larger. And so, during logging, you can see the output um, and how your model is doing at each, in this case, it's every 10 uh, steps. And if you notice after a few of these iterations that your model is not improving, but in fact getting worse, that might be a sign that something's wrong, you need to change the parameters, maybe there's something wrong with your training data set, and you can stop early and go back, fix things and restart instead of wasting a lot of time. Um, fine-tuning, uh, doing the full fine-tuning process. Yeah, so um, related to what I've been talking about is data set size. So how big or small is allowed? This is a question in the chat. What are the consequences of size and data quality for this kind of data? So regarding size, um, it depends again. And Again, the best strategy is if you have a um, particular data set in mind, just try it. 
Um, especially you can try it on a small set if you want at first, just to see, um, is there any improvement at all? Or should I just stick with a traditional, um, a traditional method that doesn't rely on pre-training and fine tuning? Um, I have seen improvement even with really small data sets. We'll see that in our example notebook um, with even just hundreds or a couple thousand examples, you can see some small improvement. Whether that improvement is worth it to you, like that size of improvement is enough reason to use this big model that's hard to interpret. Again, that's up to you and your use case and what you need from the model. But even with very small data sets, you can actually get um, improvements over traditional baselines, which we will see. But also that those results will be more unstable. There's recent work showing that like um, BERT itself is um, more unstable for certain tasks, for example. And that's of course gonna be exacerbated by smaller data sets. Um, so you would want to, if you can, if you have the resources and time to fine tune multiple times and measure that variation, that would also be good. Um, and then our final argument here is um, the evaluation strategy. So you can set this to, um, just, we're just saying run evaluation during training so that I can see what it looks like um, at each logging step. Yeah, yeah. So you can, finding these parameters is a whole art in itself. You can, the notebook I'm showing you, you can just like try things by hand, but you can also, there are like ways to search across many different parameters and make comparisons um, to find the best parameters for a particular data set and task, like grid search. And there are also, yeah, like packages designed to like help you visual, visualize all of this. And Hugging Face, again, we're gonna see this in the notebook, gives us a kind of simple way to track fine tuning and see um, like at these logging steps, how it's doing, but you can also like graph it, all these kind of interactive graphs and stuff that you can follow during fine tuning and see what performance looks like for different parameters. Okay, um, what happens after fine tuning? So after we've fine tuned our model and gone through all this process, at the end, um, we can use our model in this case for classification. So the model will return labels with the highest probability for each of our input documents. And then we're left with a list of predicted labels and our list of true labels for our tests or evaluation set. And then we can compare these in all the ways that we normally would with any machine learning model um, or from any machine learning model. So all the normal evaluation metrics you might use like accuracy, precision, recall, F1, all of this. At this point, we're just back in our normal machine learning paradigm, and we can use those evaluation metrics as you like, as normal. Um, and one question might be, how, uh, how do we measure performance outside of classification? So can we use our usual, usual language model metrics like perplexity? Um, does anyone know the answer? Can we measure perplexity for BERT? Or can you guess based on what we've heard so far about how this model works? Can we use perplexity? The way that we use perplexity. So we talked about perplexity early on when we were talking about traditional language models and gram language models as a way to measure the probability of a sequence of text given a model. It would be nice if we could use perplexity. Um, but the answer is mostly no. <laughs> um, we can't really use perplexity because of BERT using this masked language task. So it can kind of see ahead and cheat in a way. So we can't do, we can't measure perplexity in the way that we normally would. There are actually ways to kind of do this. Again, using these like sliding windows, there's a paper you can read on if you really need a score like this from BERT, but there's not um, a straightforward way to calculate perplexity. So instead, um, for example, one way to measure performance is to measure via these extrinsic evaluations, like via classification on some downstream task. And that will tell us how good our model is. So we're gonna move now into our second notebook. This is a case study of online reading communities. Um, we're gonna use some Goodreads data. This is data I've used in my own research. Um, 
Um, Goodreads is a website, a social reading website where users can chat with other members, explore book recommendations, and share their readings, ratings, and reviews. Um, and users can also tag books with free text genre or subject labels. And we're going to try to predict those um, genre labels using the text of the reviews. Um, and specifically, looking at these online reading communities, we're going to be interested in what tags the users most frequently assign to specific books, and how do these users collaborate to create functioning book catalogs? Um, because in this uh, similar websites like Library Thing and other book reviewing website, um, these tags are actually used um, for real world libraries and bookstores, or should say like physical libraries and bookstores to organize books. So they're using these user this user data to organize the book. So it'd be interesting to understand more about how users are assigning these labels um, based on their reviews, what qualities of the reviews um, they assign to different genres. So let's move into our second notebook. The link is in the chat and also in the syllabus. I'm going to stop sharing. And okay, here we are in our classification notebook. Um, can you? see the classification notebook? You're not looking at the old notebook, I hope. In my uh, screen share. Yes, it's bird classification. Awesome. Okay, so again, we're going to be using a set of book genres. So these include poetry, comics, comics and graphic novels, fantasy and paranormal, history and biography, mystery, thriller, and crime, romance, and young adult. So a very small set of genres. And these are from a data set called the UCSD Book Graph. It's a big data set of Goodreads reviews and also these tags and lots of other user and review data. Um, and we're going to follow these basic steps to follow this fine tuning and classification pattern. So we'll divide our data into training and test sets. This is a small example here. Then we'll encode our data in a format BERT will understand as we did in the previous notebook. Um, then we'll combine the data set and our target labels, the genres, into data set objects, so that's new. And then we'll load the pre-trained BERT model like before. Then we'll fine tune that model using the training data. And finally, we'll predict new labels and evaluate our performance on our test data set and look at a couple of visualizations. So I'll move more quickly this time through some parts of the notebook because we've already seen those parts before. So again, we are importing necessary libraries and modules. This is mostly the same as before. Um, and we're setting our parameters and file paths at the start. We didn't do that in the previous notebook, but I do recommend doing that in like a dedicated section like this so that you keep track of what tokenizer, what model, um, and other parameters you might be setting. Keep it all in one spot because if you mess these up, uh, it will be frustrating later. <laughs> then we're gonna load and sample our Goodreads data. Um, similar to before, these are Google Drive links, um, and we're gonna download each of these using a package called GDown um, from Google Drive. This takes a little while to run. These are pretty big. Some of these um, are over a gigabyte, so it might take you a little bit to run if you're trying to run this on your own right now. Um, and I know there have also sometimes been issues because these are Google Drive links, I believe on one of the researchers personal Google Drives. Um, you, I think people have sometimes had trouble like too many people were requesting at the same time to download these files. If that's the case, go to the UCSD book graph website, which is linked at the top of this notebook. And you can download them yourselves and then upload the way that I showed you using this um, files um, um, tool within the collab notebook. Okay, but we load the data, one uh, data set for each genre. Uh, we load the reviews. Again, I'm going over this quickly because this is just particular to this data set. I'm just trying to load the reviews and get them into a format that's usable. Um, here we can see some examples of the uh, review genre and then the review text. Uh, some of them are quite short. Some of them are quite long. Um, 
And finally, um, we can, once you have these loaded for the first time, if you want, you can dump them out into a pickle file so that you can load them more easily in the future without having to download them from Google Drive each time. Just rem remember that once you save this to also save it locally somewhere, because when your runtime ends, all your files here will disappear. So make sure to save things um, before you close the notebook or end the runtime. Then we're gonna split these book reviews into training and test sets. Um, so here I'm just saying, I want these like small sets of um, 800 reviews in our training set and 200 reviews in our test set at random from each of the genres. So we'll have 1000 reviews total for each of our target genres. And I'm again, printing out an example. Then, um, before going into BERT, I'm running a baseline model using logistic regression and a TF-IDF vectorizer. Um, this is just kind of very straightforward pipeline. I'm not doing much like tuning or anything here, but just want to see like what does performance look like on a baseline? And then we'll compare this later to our output from BERT. So here is our, um, I'm following a standard like scikit-learn pipeline, and I'm using their function called classification report to um, show my um, evaluation performance across um, the different genres. So some perform better than others, um, but in general, I have an average F1 score of about 0.5, which is better than random because I have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, I have eight genres. So 0.5 is better than random, but it's also not so great. There's definitely room for improvement and we'll see if BERT helps us. Um, and again, it's a very small data set. So what I talked about before about stability, you definitely would want to keep that in mind for this small data set and try and run this multiple times, for example. Uh, and code the data for BERT. So we did this before. I'm going to skip this section. It's exactly the same, except that we're using these book reviews instead of the Sephora data. But now, once we have our tokenized reviews, we're going to put those into a custom torch data set object. It's going to package everything up together for us, the tokenized reviews and the labels together in one. So this is a, an example um, a data set class. You can use this. This is taken from Hugging Face from their code. Um, slightly modified, I think, but pretty similar. Um, you might make some modifications for other types of data sets, but in general, this should work for classification, like simple classification tasks. And we're gonna create a data set for both our training and our test data sets. And then we're gonna examine, um, uh, pr just print out um, a couple examples to see that indeed things look the way that we expect. You can see that there's some non-English reviews that have gotten mixed up into this data. Um, then we load our pre-trained model, same as before, um, except that we're still using Distilbert, but you wanna make sure that in this case, we're using Distilbert for a sequence classification. This is gonna make sure that we add on those classification layers at the end. Oh, sorry, what is this doing in the overall process, the data set class? Um, it's just combining everything into a single object. So we have our the encodings, this is our tokenized data. And then labels, these are our book review genres in this case, just putting us, it all together into one thing and also including some functions to example, for example, here returning the number of labels and also um, getting a particular item. So it's just a way to package things together in a way that the BERT hugging face models expect. This is the format that they want the data to be in for fine tuning. Um, so again, make sure you use the sequence classification model, pre-trained model. Um, then here we're setting those training parameters for fine tuning, sorry, the fine tuning parameters um, for BERT um, that we talked about in the slides. It's exactly the same as what we showed, except here I've increased my number of warm-up steps because I do have um, you know, uh, about 800 examples, so we can set this higher. You might want to experiment with this parameter in particular and see what works better um, for your data set, or like you can even try on this data set, see if a smaller or larger number helps. Try setting it really big and see what happens, and you should see immediately a problem <laughs> during fine tuning 
and it might help you get some intuition for like what works and what doesn't work. Um, then we are going to define a function of evaluation metrics. You can have whatever you want in here. I'm just using accuracy. Um, you could add in, yeah, like F1, precision, recall, but right now it's just accuracy. So you define this yourself. And then we are sending all of this to this trainer object. So this is where we package the data into that data set class. Now we're packaging everything into this trainer object, the model, the training data set, the test data set, our training arguments, and our metrics, evaluation metrics uh, function. It's all getting put into this trainer object. So at this point, everything is held here. This was our kind of goal object all along for fine tuning. Once we have that, it's time to actually fine tune. So we're just going to call trainer.train. And then you can watch. I'm not going to run it right now again because I'm a little worried in case um, the runtime dies or anything. Um, and this takes a little while to run. Um, but you can watch as step by step um, fine tuning happens. And you should see, for example, our loss. We want to see this go down. If you don't see it going down, again, that might mean something's wrong and you might want to stop and go back and think about your training arguments, your data set, or whether this model is really going to work for your data. We're also printing the accuracy. So we should see accuracy going up over fine tuning. We should see the model getting better at modeling our data set. And we do see that here. The loss is going down, although we see it kind of plateaus at the end. And then the accuracy goes up. Again, it plateaus at the end. Then we can save this model for later. So once you have this fine-tuned model and you've gone to all this trouble, you might want to save it for future use on other data sets. You can do that by calling save model. And then you can also then load the model. So if you come back to this notebook later and you want to just start here, not run fine-tuning again, you can use this commented out line to load the model. Then we're going to evaluate by just calling trainer.evaluate and um, it will print out some evaluation metrics for us. Um, but we might also want to do some more fine grain analysis of the model. So in that case, we're going to extract the predicted labels. So we're going to get the predicted results by calling trainer.predict on our test data set. Um, this will take a moment just depending on your test data set size. And then from those um, predictions, so remember we had eight genre labels. So that's why we see this dimension as eight. And then we have um, um, our sets of documents. So we want to find the, these are sets of probabilities, a probability assigned to each of our eight genre labels for each of our test documents, our 1600 test documents or test reviews. So what we're doing in this cell is pulling out of those eight probabilities, finding the biggest one, and then converting that back to the predicted label, the text version of that label that we can read and understand. So at the end, we should have our predicted labels being the same size as our uh, number of documents. And then once we have that, again, now we're back to a traditional, you know, like scikit-learn or other machine learning pattern. And we can use classification report or other functions to um, compare our predicted labels and our true labels from our test data set. So here we can see that now we have a average F1 score of 0.55. So looks like we did improve at least a little bit. This was a very small data set. So um, maybe that's why the improvement isn't so big, but we do see a little improvement. Again, you would want to run this multiple times to check that this is a stable result. Um, and maybe you'd want to put in some more of the training data next time now that we know that there is some advantage to doing this and it's worth the time and cost. But there is, it looks like we did get some improvement, which is good. And then um, I just have some little output at the very end uh, showing uh, how you could use these labels to explore this kind of data set some more. So this doesn't really have anything in particular to do with BERT, 
other than um, because we were able to get better accuracy with BERT, um, maybe these results are more a little bit more reliable. Um, so we can look for the true label and the predicted label for any given review and look for cases where they match and where they don't match. So places where we got the label right and places where we got the label wrong. And I'm just going to skip to the end. You can explore this more on your own, but I'm going to skip down to a visualization I made. So it's a, just a heat map showing um, the true label along the y-axis and the predicted label are along the x-axis. And we can compare how often we get these labels right or wrong. And when we get them wrong, which other labels we classify them as. So here things are a little obfuscated because it's good. Um, the diagonal is the darkest. That means most often we predict children reviews are children reviews. This is good. We predict that comics and graphic novels are comics and graphic novels. But sometimes we make mistakes. And so if we remove the diagonal, we can see those mistakes more clearly. And so we can see, for example, that fantasy and paranormal reviews are often misclassified as young adult. Romance is often also misclassified as young adult, um, whereas children are sometimes misclassified as comics and graphic novels. You could do this for larger sets of genres and start to build up some understanding about the relationships between these genres based on the text of the reviews and maybe how these relate to traditional notions of genre um, outside of online uh, reading communities. Okay, pause there. Um, that's the end of this notebook. Um, I know we went fast through certain parts that we had looked at before. So any questions at this point? Okay, if there are no questions, um, I'll move back to the slides. And I was gonna have a break next, but I think I might just keep going because it hasn't been so long since our last break. And I wanna make sure that we get through. Yeah, great. Um, try it out on your own data. You can use that same notebook, just replace the data parts with your own data and have fun and <laughs> try it out. Uh, I was wondering if binary classification is a good idea on BERT. Um, yeah, you can definitely, it, yeah, should be, should be fine. Um, you can use however many labels. I mean, as you get to like massive numbers of labels, things get messy, but binary classification should be fine. Okay, so we are going to move now to GPT-3. So we're gonna switch gears from BERT to a different kind of model. This section is gonna be a lot shorter um, because we've already built up a lot of the building blocks of what goes on inside these transformer models. And we're just gonna be looking more at what is different between BERT and GPT-3. So differences from BERT. Um, GPT model, so there's GPT-2, GPT-3, I guess there's an original GPT. I've never actually used it. I've only used GPT-2 and GPT-3. Um, these are a set of models from OpenAI. Um, so they're created by different people from BERT. Um, BERT is, uh, the authors I believe are from Google. Um, and GPT models are used originally, and um, not even sure if it's accurate to say mostly anymore, but more than BERT, <laughs> they're used for generation tasks. Although they can also be used for other tasks via prompting, which we'll look at. Um, some of these generation tasks include machine translation, generating text in a given style or on a given topic, finishing a story started by a user. These are the models that are really popular. You'll see them like in um, op-eds and like news articles where people will try to like talk to a model or like ask it questions and it will generate responses. Often they're using a model like GPT-3. 
Um, and GPT models are more like traditional language models than BERT, as you can assign probabilities to the sequences and then generate these sequences, kind of like the n-gram language model that we looked at at the beginning. Um, another difference from BERT is accessibility. So like I said, um, GPT-3 is controlled by OpenAI, it's created by OpenAI, um, and GPT-3 is private. So you need a license or to pay for access. Um, GPT-2 GPT GPT is more accessible, um, but doesn't perform as well as GPT-3. We'll talk about differences between those models in a moment. And another difference from BERT is the architecture. So where BERT was a stack of encoders, GPT models are stacks of decoders. Um, GPT models are also autoregressive. This means that as they generate output, that output becomes part of the input, um, which makes sense. If you generate like a story, you need to know what you said before to be able to continue the story. Um, uh, Self-attention masks tokens following the current token. So rather than masking at random, in the way that we did for the masked model in BERT. Now we're masking instead the um, tokens following the current token so that we can't look ahead and we can't kind of cheat in the way that BERT would be able to cheat if you were trying to do the same task. And um, tokens are generated one at a time uh, and masked self-attention remembers the query key and value matrices that we talked about from the previous token. So those are stored for the next token so that you don't have to recalculate them every time. And we'll look at what this, what this looks like visually. Um, so uh, like before, we have um, word vectors and position vectors. We no longer have the segment vectors. Um, so that part is mostly the same as BERT. But then we enter, we do go one token at a time. And we're going to pass through a stack of decoders instead of a stack of encoders. Um, so we're going to use masked self-attention, what I just mentioned, where we mask the tokens following the current token rather than the masking that we used, um, the type of masking that we used during the pre-training in, in BERT. But then a lot of this looks similar. We still have a feed forward sublayer as part of the decoder block. And then we have a stack of decoders in the same way we had a stack of encoders. Um, but then we're going to have an output vector at the end, which will then multiply by our original word embedding matrix to get probabilities over the words in the vocabulary and make a prediction of what word we want to, for example, generate next. Again, if we were trying to generate text as our task. So that's the architecture overview. Um, one more difference from BERT is around pre-training and fine-tuning. So um, remember BERT, um, the pre-training tasks were the masked word prediction and next sentence prediction. And the loss was a combination of those two tasks. For GPT models, the pre-training task is next word prediction um, instead of um, the other tasks for BERT. And um, where the other difference is that what we just did with BERT, fine tuning for classification, um, you pretty much always need to do that for BERT if you're doing classification or like these specialized tasks. But that's a costly process. As you see, if you try running this yourself, it takes some time, even for that small data set to run fine tuning. Um, and one big advantage and very interesting, like currently very interesting thing um, research wise about these big GPT models is that you can actually use them just the pre-trained model without any fine tuning for a bunch of NLP tasks like classification. And it can actually work really, really, really well, like, like surprisingly or alarmingly well. And there's a lot still to explore here. And the way that that's done is via a process called prompting. So the GPT model is huge, it's pre-trained on a ton of data. And because of that, it somehow knows enough that as long as you prompt the model um, in a certain way, it's able to produce output, for example, giving you a class label that you're looking for, even though you didn't fine tune the model. So going into that in a little bit more detail about prompting, although GPT models are designed for these generation tasks, 
we can use them for other tasks like classification by attaching, by attaching additional text to the prompt. So for example, um, normally you would prompt these models by, um, for example, like you give it the beginning of a story um, or like the first half of a sentence, and then you ask the model to finish the story or finish the sentence. But now, in addition to the document text that we give to the model, we're also gonna ask it, for example, a question, like what is the genre of this article? Sorry, I need to pause and take a drink. Um, so we can ask, what is the genre of this article as part of the prompt? And it will often, for many tasks, produce perfectly legible output that works very well, um, even without any fine tuning. So that's great because we didn't need to fine tune the model, A, like we didn't have to go through that costly process of fine tuning that takes time and energy. Um, and um, we didn't need labeled data. So if you have a data set that you're interested in and there's some label that you want to output, but you don't have the labels, maybe you don't have the money to pay a bunch of people to label data, or you don't have the time to do that because you're just exploring the data set, this is a great way to, can be a great way to um, get that output without labeled data. And there's a whole research subfield dedicated to prompt engineering. Um, and some of these are really funny, like, and fascinating. If you can feel magical, like incantations, but you learn certain word patterns that you can add as to the prompt that will produce a certain kind of desirable output. So I can't remember the exact word, but there've been examples where it's like, like generating code. If you, I think they might actually use this if I remember correctly as part of the, um, uh, Microsoft, Microsoft owns GitHub and uses all the code on GitHub to train a big language model for code prediction. And then you can use that as a tool when you're coding yourself, it will predict what code you should write next based on the code you've written so far. And I think, or at least I've seen some experiment where they included like, is like write good code <laughs> or like write, um, write clean Python code or something like this. You can add prompts like this and it can actually help a lot or like write a smart reply, <laughs> write a good, uh, an intelligent reply and it will produce better output sometimes. So there's a whole world of prompt engineering out there and a bunch of papers and I'm sure more papers to come. Okay, um, does next word prediction mean, no, it will, it will produce, it can produce like a whole, a whole book of text, but it will go one word at a time. Uh, is GPT capable of running well out of the box without fine tuning because it uses the next word prediction as opposed to the mass word like BERT? Um, I think it's less that and more the size of the data and the fact that you can um, use these prompts to just generate um, output. Like again, whether or not the data it fits to your data set, you also need to fit to the task like to the labels, but because we're using this prompts and generation, we don't need, we don't need to create a probability vector over the labels and softmax it and all of that. Um, we can just ask it to generate what the next word should be, except that in this case, we're asking what next word is the label, if that makes sense. Uh, what is the defining factor which enables the out of the box? Okay, so same question. Um, it's the data set size and the generation capability, I would say. Um, and can we get perplexity? Yes. In this case, we can get perplexity. We're back in normal, mostly normal language modeling land which is what our coding notebook will be about. Okay, and then a final note in this section about GPT-2 versus GPT-3. Um, the architecture is the same. It's that same stack of decoders, maybe some minor differences, but overall pretty much the same. Um, but GPT-3 is trained on a lot more data. So GPT-2 was big. It was trained on a data set that they created, um, I believe, for GPT-2 called WebText. Um, it's a bunch of texts from the web. Q 
contained about 10 billion tokens, which is already massive, but GPT-3 was even bigger. So it combined multiple different data sets. So an updated version of web text, also common crawl data set, which is a common data set in NLP, one of these big um, shared uh, web data sets, books one, books two, and Wikipedia, resulting in about 499 billion tokens. So it's a lot of data, and that's the main difference between GPT-2 and GPT-3. OK, so now um, we're going to, again, move into the final notebook. Um, and we're going to look at perplexity. And we're going to use GPT-2 to get some perplexity scores for a data set of interest. So I'm going to switch. Okay, we are now in our final notebook, measuring change in perplexity. Oops, this should say GPT-2, not GPT-3. You could do this with GPT-3, I believe, should work the same way, um, but this is actually using GPT-2, not GPT-3, because it's more accessible. Okay, as before, so we're still using Hugging Face, so a lot of what we're doing is going to look the same as our BERT notebooks. So again, at the beginning, we're importing um, all the necessary libraries, including the Hugging Face library. Um, I'm also just changing to a different version of Torch because of one of the functions that I'm using later. There's a bug in, it's in one of the... Um, um, in, in the perplexity metric that we're using from Hugging Face. Um, and I think you have to use this um, particular version of Torch. This, at least for me, took a little while to reinstall and then you have to restart the runtime. So just keep that in mind. If you don't do this, you will have a bug later in the code. Okay, and so this is that part of the code where you will run into an error if you try and run this function. So this function gets perplexity from a sequence. Um, so this is from uh, this link on Hugging Face. So they explain exactly how to get perplexity for this type of model. So remember that it's a fixed length model. Like BERT, um, you can uh, only input documents of a certain length. Um, and um, this makes the perplexity calculation slightly complicated. So overall, we're just doing normal perplexity, but we're going to use this sliding window so that we can get a perplexity score over an entire document, even if it's much longer. And then we're gonna combine those perplexity scores into one final score. So I'm not gonna go into detail about each of these lines of code because there's this great resource at this link um, where they run through the whole thing and explain why they um, do the calculation in this way. So check that if you're interested. Otherwise, just treat this part of the code as a black box that gives us a perplexity score given an input text sequence. Then we have a function to fine tune a model. So this, again, it's going to look very similar to BERT, even though now we're using GPT-2 as a model. But we're still calling it in the same way from Hugging Face. We're loading a pre-trained model. Um, and we are um, tokenizing using a different tokenizer this time, but otherwise the commands look the same. So here we're passing our tokenizer and creating a text data set. Um, and then um, putting that all into what's called a data collator. This is another um, data um, object type from Hugging Face where we pass in our tokenizer. And then we're passing all of that, uh, or sorry, and then we have our training arguments, which are, um, in this case, uh, I think these are almost identical to the set that we looked at before, except that some of the numbers might be different. Um, so I might have like, you know, set these steps higher or lower depending on my data set size, but otherwise these look very similar. We don't have the, um, I haven't input anything about the, uh, um, learning rate or anything like that. Um, but these are just, these are all the default settings, I think, from Hugging Face for GPT-2. Again, try playing with them. 
Um, and then all of that, again, is going into our trainer object that, again, collects everything together, the data sets, the training arguments, the data collator, um, and the um, tokenizer. Or sorry, the tokenizer went into the data collator, which is then sent to the trainer. Um, and again, we can then fine tune a model and then save the model. And I've put all this into a function this time so that you can reuse it for many different data sets and then make comparisons across them. So we could fine tune on like different slices of our data set and then compare. Next, we have a function to get our um, perplexity scores after fine tuning. So our goal in this notebook is going to be to compare our perplexity scores before and after fine tuning, because what we should see in theory is that perplexity gets our language model gets better and the perplexity scores get lower after fine tuning. Um, so we this function pulls out the perplexity scores after fine tuning, whereas the other function was pulling the perplexity from the original model. Um, okay, so those are our essential functions. Now we're going to move into a particular data set of interest. So here we're again going to use the book reviews data, the same data set from the UCSC book graph that we used before, except this time, um, just because fine tuning does take time, I'm going to only show you one example. So we're just going to do the poetry reviews for now. And if you're interested, you can go back and rerun this with the different genres of reviews and compare things. So I'm downloading the same way as before the poetry reviews. These are the same functions as the classification notebook. So I'm going to skip over this, except to say, here's what a review looks like. Here's a random review. Great writing. Enjoyed this book about growing up. Yeah. Um, then we are going to load the GPT-2 model and get the original perplexity scores for our poetry reviews. So here I am loading that pre-trained model. And I'm also loading the tokenizer, a match tokenizer. And then I'm using my um, uh, perplexity function that we defined above um, to get a perplexity score for each of the reviews. So each review is going to be assigned a score saying how well the model models this review or how difficult this review is for the model. Um, this uh runs pretty quickly at least for me um and um but again this is where when you call this function for the first time this is where you might get a bug if you didn't um install that particular version of torch at the beginning so this is where things would break if you didn't do that but at the end of this so we just tokenize and then we pull out the complexities from our pre-trained model and at the end, we have um, a set of perplexities, one for each review. Now we're going to fine tune. Um, we're going to just operation, there are different ways to do this, but we're just gonna put all of our poetry reviews into a single file that we're gonna send to the model for fine tuning um, using our fine tune function that we defined above. So here I'm saying do the poetry reviews. This is going to be the name that we use to name like the output file and the model file and that kind of stuff. So if you were using a different genre, put that other genre here, the model and the device. Again, that's CUDA. And we can see fine tuning happening. Probably I should have set um, uh, some of my uh, logging steps smaller, for example, because we just did one. <laughs> just we only see one step here. Um, so play with that if you want, but fine tuning happened. It was successful. And now we can see how successful was it by getting the new perplexities for the reviews after fine tuning. So exactly as before, we call get fine tune perplexity. Well, not as before. Now we're using the fine tune perplexities function, but same as before, it's going to call that um, get perplexity function. Um, for each of the reviews. So for each of the reviews, we have a new perplexity score. And at the end of this, we can just rearrange everything again into a single data frame so that it's nice and organized. So now we have um, a data frame where each row is a review 
Um, we include the tag. Again, if you did this for multiple genres, you can include the different tags here. We have the original perplexity score and the new perplexity score. And what we want to see is that the new perplexity scores are smaller than the old perplexity scores. And we can call um, on the data frame a function called dot describe. This is a pandas function. And it will just print out some summary statistics for the um, numerical columns in our uh, data frame. In this case, original perplexity and new perplexity. And we can see that the mean um, has gotten a lot smaller. So in general, the perplexity score went down for these data points. Now remember in this case that we uh, fine tuned and then are kind of testing on the same exact data set. Um, the same reviews. You could do this with a different set of reviews um, and see what happens then. This is just to show you kind of what's happening and to check that our model is doing what we think it should do. So definitely if we fine tune on a text and then we get the perplexity for that same text, we definitely would think that the perplexity would go down for those exact same texts. For texts that aren't exactly the same, but that are similar, we would still think the perplexity would go down, but it might not go down as much. So try that out. All that you'll need to change is in the pre-processing, switch to using a train and test set and change where you, um, which set you've used to calculate the perplexity scores and which you use for fine tuning. And you can do this comparison again. And then you can also run on the different genres. And, we can also print out then which reviews specifically improved or didn't improve as much. Um, and we can think about why that might be while examining the text of these reviews. So in this case, um, I'm printing out the change in perplexity. So first I'm calculating that change in perplexity as the new perplexity minus the original perplexity. Um, this is just a very simple way to score the sentences. You might wanna think if you're doing this um, for data that you really care about, how um, like more uh, more representative ways of calculating this change in perplexity, because some sentences might, for example, always improve because they're really rare, as we're going to see, and they aren't particular to this particular data set, except by kind of chance. So we see when we print out the reviews that improve the most, the perplexity goes down the most, um, they're non-English reviews. And that makes sense. It might not be particularly useful for us, depending on what our use case was for these reviews, but it makes sense that if we're using an English language, a pre-trained language, a pre-trained model on English language data, that when we give it this non-English data, it would improve a lot very quickly at those examples and maybe not as much for some other data. There are just a few examples that actually got worse or like a little bit worse. That can definitely happen. It's a little surprising to see that, again, given that we're showing it exactly the same fine tuning and test data, um, but these are very short sentences. So that might be part of why we're seeing um, just kind of like a random, you know, random increase in perplexity. But everything else got smaller, so that's good. And again, we can run this on different genres. Um, I couldn't get the image in here, but I will show you quickly um, what the what this output would look like. Okay, so if we ran on a really big set of genres, so here I think it's about 60 genres, I believe. Um, and it's similar to before, we're showing um, along the y-axis the um, books genre and along the uh, x-axis the uh, fine-tune tag. So if we fine-tune um, on uh, this uh, tag, reviews from this tag, how does the model um, 
improve or not improve for the other genres. So we can see some kind of predictable associations like, let's see, animals, books that are in the animals genre tend to improve for picture book. Um, and picture book also improves for animals. Um, let's see, graphic novel improves for uh, oh, graphic novel itself. Um, we also see some stripes. So what is this? Uh, I included like a uh, random, so random sets of reviews from across all the genres. And those tend to um, improve. Remember, lower scores are better because we want things to go down. So if we fine tune on a set of random reviews across all different genres, that generally improves across all the different genres. So this is a, a way to start thinking about these genres. If you're interested in like questions of literary reception, like you're a scholar who studies um, literary genre and how readers respond to different types of books, you might be interested in this data for that. And or you might be interested in choosing the best fine tuning set for your data set. Like what distribution should you sample from? Should you use more of this genre, more of that genre, a random set across all of them? And figures like this can help you explore that. And I also just think they're kind of they're kind of fun, fun to look at and read through. Um, so that's the end of this notebook. This was our final notebook. Um, we have about half an hour left, I believe. Correct me if wrong. Um, any questions at this point before we move into the final slides? Okay, if there are no questions, we will continue into a final section. Um, we could take a break now, or we could just keep going. I think we have about, again, like half an hour left. I am happy to keep going, but if anyone wants a break, we could take a break. Um, maybe just drop in the chat if you prefer that we take a break. And if no one speaks up, we'll keep going. But if you wanna take a break, we can take a break. <laughs> okay, we're gonna take a short break um, because we have been going for a while. So I wanna make sure, again, people have food and water and um, we will reconvene in five minutes, okay? Um, to see you for the very last part of this tutorial. So see you in five minutes.
All right. Um, we're going to move into the final part of the tutorial. Um, we're going to leave behind coding at this point and also um, model internals. And we're going to be talking more about these models at a high level and also how they've been used in research, some cool research applications that I've seen. Um, so first, the ethics of using these large language models. This has been a huge discussion, especially for the last um, year or two around um, uh, when it is appropriate or not appropriate, or if it's appropriate at all to use models that are trained on so much data that we can't, we don't even know what's in the data because it's too big for us to document and explore fully. Um, so we're going to talk through some of these concerns and resources. So first, um, just wanted to share a list of resources discussing data ethics ethics in general. These aren't uh, necessarily specific to transformers or particular kind of model, but to technology and machine learning and data science in general. Um, I really recommend each of these books. They give you a lot of food for thought and also some, I think, practical scenarios to think through if you work in industry or if you work as a data scientist or as a researcher and you're having to make calls about what kind of data you use, how to use that data, and you need a way to think through um, for example, um, whether to use the data and how to use it. So especially this framework at the end called the Belmont Report. This is a famous framework in the United States that used, for example, if you do like any kind of like uh, university training around research ethics, you may have, you probably should have been reading about the Belmont Report, which is a really useful framework in thinking through these kinds of issues, mostly around who benefits from this research um, and this data usage, and how can we respect people's agency um, and, um, and do this in a just way. So recommend all these books, papers, frameworks, and there's many more where these come from. You can follow their citations down a whole rabbit hole into this field. There's also a conference called FACT, F-A-C-C-T, um, that produces a lot of research on these topics. Um, they just had their most recent conference this summer with a lot of new work, um, a lot of it on large language models. So check that out. Um, there's a particular paper, paper called On the Dangers of Stochastic Parrots. Can language models be too big? This paper called a big stir for a lot of reasons. Um, but the main point is that these big models seem to be very successful, as we've seen. Um, but what can we claim that they actually do? Do they understand language? Or are they better understood as parroting patterns that they don't understand? Um, and we need to be very careful about the claims we're making and also about how we choose to use and whether we choose to use models that, again, are trained on data sets that are really, really, really big. Some risks outlined in that paper around using these large training data sets are that, first, size doesn't guarantee diversity. So it's not guaranteed that you're representing different people or um, different viewpoints just because you have a ton of data. You can think about all that data from Reddit. So if you spend time on the internet, like on Reddit or on um, other parts of the internet, and you think about the data that's crawled from there, we know that those actually aren't very diverse places, language-wise, um, political viewpoints, racially, gender, um, so if you want if you want to value diversity in your data set, which you might also just for accuracy reasons, um, size doesn't guarantee diversity. Um, social views change over time. And so if you're not updating your model, um, you're not going to be modeling these changing social views. So again, for accuracy, but also for in the interest of um, modeling, um, for example, more inclusive views over time, you might want to consider that with these large models. Um, encoding bias. So there's a lot of work on measuring bias, um, both in word embeddings and that we talked about earlier, like those earlier models like word to vec and glove, and in these newer um, contextualized vectors and in the models themselves. Um, so stereotypes about, again, people's race or gender can be I mean, are encoded in these models in some really troubling ways. Um, so if you work in industry and you want to deploy these models, you're going to have to think very carefully about how to account for those problems so that you don't end up in a 
aside from anything else, a PR disaster and also some really unjust outcomes for the people using your tools. Then there's finally risks around curation, duration, and accountability. So who made these data sets? Who's maintaining them? Who can access them? Who's even allowed to explore these data sets? Again, they're so big that they can be unwieldy and they also contain a lot of private data. So if you're scraping all of Reddit, Reddit itself allows you to delete your posts later as a user. But if this data has now been copied and lives somewhere on someone's you know, supercomputer somewhere, you no longer have access to it and you can't delete it or edit it in the way that you normally would. You might not even know that that's happened. So, these are all, again, risks to think through when choosing to use these kinds of models and these kinds of data sets. Um, again, they're really big. Some of these models include, as we've talked about before, the Books Corpus, English Wikipedia. There's a giant um, open model called The Pile, which is just such a great name. I think accurate to the kind of, it's self-consciously, you know, referring to like how this model, get, all, all this data gets piled into these models. Um, there's also uh, the colossal clean crawled corpus and the colossal, they're so big, too big, for example, to even measure um, um, like basic summary statistics about these data sets can be very difficult to compute. Um, one example of how this, you know, interesting ways of this pre-training data these choices and curation or lack of curation sometimes um, can play out um, I saw this via Nick Vincent's Twitter and I keep thinking about this and what an interesting choice it was. So for this new uh, Facebook model, OPT, um, they use this training data, data from Reddit, but they only use the longest comment threads on Reddit. Um, and you can think about, again, if you spend time there on similar online forums or on Facebook, the longest comment threads, for example, might include more arguing they might be more toxic. Um, they may have other qualities that aren't um, shared with shorter comment threads. So there's a lot to think through in regards to the curation and use of these different data sets and more documentation would be really helpful, but often that work of data curation and documentation isn't valued, even though it's so important and so useful. Um, again, Languages for, or models for other languages, um, A, aren't as common, even though there are a lot, there still is going to be overall better coverage and performance for languages like English. And then even when we have uh, models for other languages, sometimes the performance can be really disappointing. So there's recent work from a conference called ICWSM, the Conference on Web and Social Media Data, that compared models across different languages and found that um, both non-English monolingual and multilingual BERT on, underperform on their target languages in comparison to English BERT tested on English data. And we could think about why that is, but certainly one of the reasons why is that many non-English data sets are poorly curated. So there's a paper, or I believe a poster, I'm not sure if there's associated paper, um, auditing some of these multilingual data sets um, that are common in NLP and finding that, uh, I'll just quote, lower resource corpora has systematic issues. At least 15 corpora have no usable text and a significant fraction contains less than 50% sentences of acceptable quality. In addition, many are mislabeled or use non-standard or ambiguous language codes. Um, this is not good. <laughs> um, so don't take things at face value. Um, if you find a model on Hugging Face or a data set on Hugging Face, as usual, as a good data scientist, dig into the data, read it, check it, make sure you have a domain expert who's also looking at the data, someone who speaks the language who's looking at the data and checking that it's actually in the language that you think it's in because apparently that's not always the case, which is alarming. There's also questions around interpretability and explainability. I've touched earlier on how this is a challenge for these big models. Um, and so in the real world, again, we often care a lot about interpretability and explainability. We don't just care about how good the performance is. We wanna be able to explain it. Um, but these large models are notoriously difficult to interpret. They're just, again, too big. 
Um, for example, even just measuring the number of duplicate documents in the training data, that alone is a research problem. There's a paper on it. Um, so that just that saying how many duplicates are in this pre-training set, that alone is really costly and difficult. Um, I like this recent paper, um, actually a couple of recent papers from Harman Preet Kaur on sense making and interpretability um, and checking our own sense making biases as data sets. Um, I really recommend especially the second paper, which was presented at FACT, the conference I uh, referred to earlier um, around fairness, accountability and transparency in um, um, uh, machine learning and data science. Um, and this framework, I'm not going to step through it now, but this is, gives a good framework for thinking through the different types of sense making processes. Um, so how we make sense of models um, as data scientists, how we interact with the machine as data scientists um, that are good to be aware of. Now for the very last part, um, I'm going to go through just two research, quick research examples of how these large language models are being used in research. Um, there is, of course, tons of research on all different topics, using these models for all different purposes and different domains. I'm just going to highlight two examples that are, one is a paper that I was a co-author on, and another is a paper that um, I know the authors, and I just find it a really interesting application. So just to give you some inspiration at the end of this talk and some pointers also of where to get started reading some of these research papers. So first example, um, this is a paper that I was involved in, um, and it's about prompting. So remember we talked about prompting and GPT-2, GPT-3, and how to design these prompts. So this was a project about prompting without using any labeled data. Um, and we were interested in, um, and this is a paper led by Dominic Staunbach at ETH um, on heroes, villains, and victims. So can we, given a text, like a news article or a political speech or a Disney movie plot, whatever text, um, can we identify the hero, villain, and victim in the text if they exist? We've kind of chosen data set where we believe that there will be these um, um, personas. Um, but of course, that might not always be the case. And it turns out that, yeah, GPT-3 can do this across diverse domains without any fine tuning. Um, of course, good to keep in mind, it's so big that some of these results are sure to be memorized. So in particular, in the case of the Disney movie plots, um, it's quite likely because those stories are so common, so popular and are referenced in different places, um, you might know that Cinderella is the, well, I don't know actually, is she a hero or a victim? Um, but we might know that the wicked stepmother is the villain. And you, you know that from many different places and that might be repeated across many different data sets. And so because GPT-3 is so big, it might actually be memorizing that particular output. But for other of these, I don't think memorization is less likely depending on the data set. And we can look at some of these results and also what these prompts look like. So this is the prompt, an example of prompt. We give all that text as input to GPT-3. Who's the villain in the following text? Um, and uh, then we prompt with um, the um, text that we are interested in. Um, with the GPT completion shown here in bold. So it's able to complete, this is the villain, this is the hero, this is the victim. And it does pretty well, again, without any fine tuning on the data set. Um, we can compare the accuracy. So one challenge you can, I think immediately, if you are trying to do this, you'll run into. So if this is the output, so sometimes it will nicely output like for victim, the New York consumers. So it's just the noun phrase. But in other cases, it's these long phrases, and you're gonna have to normalize them um, to you know, whatever you know, entity type, for example, you're looking for. And so evaluation is going to take some manual labor and time. But um, compared to a previous baseline for this task, GPT-3 performs way better at least on this very small data set, because again, it 
takes a lot of time and effort. And this was a kind of proof of concept paper, um, but it does perform a lot better than a baseline. Again, even though we didn't fine tune, we're just prompting. We can uh, see the results for these Disney movie plots. Um, again, I think a lot of these might be memorized, uh, but uh, it's still interesting to see like how well the model is able to pick out the hero, victim, and villain. Um, so for 101 Dalmatians, it can say that Roger, the main character, is indeed the hero. The victim are the Dalmatian puppies. If you're not familiar with the story, there's a villain, Cruella de Vil, who wants to turn the puppies into a fur coat. Um, she's really a horrible villain. And so it, the model was correctly able to pick out these different entities. Of course, there's some ambiguity here. This particular um, task is really interesting to think about who's the victim, who's really the hero. Um, there's reasons, especially in political speeches, why we might be interested. So here's some output for political speeches. Um, again, picking out who was framed as the hero, villain, or victim. And we can see, for example, that for Republican presidents in the US, um, like Bush and Trump, the heroes, victims, and villains um, are connected to the US military and wars in the Middle East. While for democratic speeches, for example, by Obama, they have a more populist flavor with the average American portrayed as a hero. Um, and for Democrats, the villains and victims, intriguingly, we would need to dig into this more, but according to this particular model, the villains and victims are both associated with the education system in this particular data set. So some interesting um, applications here, if you have similar data sets and are interested in digging into relationships between your documents, between sets of data, as we did here with the Democratic and Republican speeches, this can be a great way to explore and use these big models um, for your data. Um, and then a second example, um, there is a, now a whole research field referred to um, as Bertology. So given that we have these big models and given how well they perform, um, we want to know how will they perform, especially on certain linguistic tasks. So how are they, how well are they really modeling different um, language phenomena? Um, and a lot of papers in recent years have tried to figure out what BERT can and cannot model and what these other, also other uh, transformer-based and big pre-trained models can model or not model. And also how consistent BERT is across different data and phenomena. So there's a recent paper here on generalization across different BERT models, um, and also how um, modifications to transformer-based language models can affect their ability to learn linguistic knowledge. There's a bunch of papers. These are just two examples. And then digging into one particular example from a colleague of mine at Cornell, um, Forrest Davis. Um, he led this project on priming. So we can kind of like prompting, we can prime a novel, give it some text to fine tune on, and then see how well it does um, on new data with the same linguistic phenomena. So for example, in this particular paper, they um, Forrest um, and his advisor, they're linguists. Um, and Forrest was interested in this particular kind of construction where you have a sentence like Sally frightened Mary because she was so terrifying. And you wanna know who is terrifying. And at least in English, um, you are much more likely to assume that she is referred, well, you can think to yourself, do you think it's Sally or Mary? You can put in the chat if you want, who's terrifying. And we'll see if people are consistent. Um, is Sally terrifying or is Mary terrifying? I know we're at the very end. Um, okay, well, you probably might think that, yes. Awesome, thank you. So consistent, Sally, right? And it turns out that there's, I'm not a linguist, um, go check the paper <laughs> for the full details. Um, but there's this phenomenon where because it's a negative phrase around terrifying, um, we're more likely to associate it with Sally, with the subject. But if it was positive, um, like I forget, like Sally admired Mary because she was so talented. So Sally admired Mary because she was so talented. 
in that case, you might probably be more likely to think that she refers to Mary because it's positive. So it's just a funny thing um, in English that we happen to associate with some probability depending on positive or negative in this particular kind of construction. And what we want to know, given that humans do this, does Bert do this? So this is what we would expect to find. Um, this is the like human effect that you've just demonstrated where um, the light purple shows the, the object, like if the antecedent is actually the object. And then do we predict, um, are you more likely as a person to predict object or um, subject? And so we see like you're more likely to predict object when the antecedent is in fact the object. And you're more likely to predict subject when the antecedent is in fact the subject. So people are good at this in English, at picking out which one is really meant. And it turns out we can do this again. We can prime BERT with a bunch of examples or even just a small set of these examples and then see how it performs on a similar set. And um, it's not quite to the level of a human. Um, like you can see that overall there's a bias in BERT towards predicting the object rather than the subject um, as the antecedent, but it is lower. So you can see that the object box went down for the subject bias and the subject box went up a bit. So it seems to summarize, go check the paper with full details, but to summarize this figure, it does seem that BERT can somewhat um, model those probabilities in the way that we model them when we're trying to figure out who a pronoun refers to in a sentence when we have these positive and negative um, constructions. So that's really cool. Um, okay, a closing thought. Um, I just saw a part of this talk uh, by Alison Gopnik. Um, it's on YouTube. If you, I guess let's look her up on YouTube. I think you can find the talk. Sorry, I didn't put a link, but um, talking about these language models and large language models in particular as cultural technologies. So she said, cultural technologies allow humans to access, summarize, and use knowledge and discoveries other humans have made. It's not intelligent, but it allows humans to access the intelligence of other humans. Kind of like she said, like libraries or language or writing itself. I thought that was a really interesting way to think about these models and their use and whether or not they're intelligent. Um, I would agree with her, they're not intelligent, um, but they're really, they are useful for certain things. Um, and one way to think about this is upstream versus downstream research. So are we interested in downstream tasks, um, like predicting job ads, or are we interested in measuring something about the training data set itself? Um, and in that case, um, we're using these models more as these cultural technologies rather than as tools for a task. So it's different ways of thinking about these models, different ways of using them in research and in industry and in different domains. Just some final tips. Read the original papers. So we've talked about a lot today. Um, go back, read the original BERT paper, read the attention is all you need paper read the GPT-2 and GPT-3 blog posts on the OpenAI website. Um, they're really useful. They have all the detail in there. But then there are also all these tutorials, YouTube videos. Again, someone suggested the like, whatever it's called, three brown, one blue or whatever. Um, amazing, amazing visualizations and um, teaching people have done online. Take advantage of it. Play with the code in Google Colab. It's available to you after the tutorial. Don't be afraid of breaking things and be critical of these models. Don't just accept what um, is shown to you in a paper or what's shown to you in a blog post or what you read um, in a popular article about these models. Try it out for yourself and think critically about what the model is actually doing and what it's actually modeling and what it can and can't do. And that is it, right on time. Thank you all so much for participating, for sticking with me so many of you for four hours on a friday evening or a friday morning or whatever time it is where you are 
Thank you for all your questions. Um, you can put more questions. I'll hang out here for a couple more minutes at least. Um, but thank you all for participating and thank you, Herdy School, for having me. It's been really fun. Thank you so much, Marie. It's been absolutely fantastic. Uh, thank you. And uh, there's a couple questions in the in the chat. Um, yeah, there's a lot of gratitude. Thank, thanks, thanks. There is like one question from Swen. Is it common in the field to publish the code that was used to produce the results in the paper? Uh, Great question. <laughs> um, sometimes it's increasingly common. And there are initiatives like Papers with Code. I think Hugging Face itself is a great example of trying to open up things to more people. But I would say NLP in particular, we are not great at this. Or even the code might be published, but it is really hard to use. It's not as much of a norm in NLP as it is in some other fields. Um, and of course, it depends on who made the model and how much they. Um, you know, how much it's a company secret, what they exactly did. I don't see any other questions, but thank you all. If you have any final questions, I'm here. Otherwise, I hope this was helpful and hope you go out and use these models. Yeah. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for participating in our school and in this final workshop. Thank you.